Hey, good morning. I am Donovan Richards, former chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and I'm sitting in for my colleague Costa, the chair today, who is unfortunately sick. Today, the committee will hold an oversight hearing on our wastewater infrastructure and our plans for achieving compliance with the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act of 1972 was enacted to protect and restore waters of the United States. The Clean Water Act aims to prevent, reduce, and eliminate pollution in waters across the nation in order to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. The goal of the Clean Water Act is to make the nation's surface waters fishable and swimmable. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, oversees compliance of the Clean Water Act, which regulates certain types of stormwater discharges as well as wastewater discharges into water bodies nationwide. The New York City Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, manages the city's more than 7,500 miles of wastewater infrastructure. Some areas of the city, however, have a separate sewer system consisting of two different systems of sewer pipes. One system of pipes carries wastewater from buildings to wastewater treatment plant plants. The other system of pipes known as Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, MS4, carries water from the streets to local waterways. When it rains in the areas that are served by an MS4 system, stormwater collects and flows across impervious surfaces, including sidewalks, streets, and parking lots, picking up pollutants such as oil, chemicals, and pathogens along the way. Since 1990, large cities such as New York City have been required to obtain a permit to discharge stormwater from MS4s, and since 1999, all urban areas have been required to obtain such a permit. New York City has some 522 miles of shoreline, and the DEP is tasked with improving water quality of our city's waterways. In certain areas of the city, the, the sewer, in storm sewer in storm water systems are combined. In fact, approximately 60 percent of the city's sewer system is combined, and 65 percent to 90 percent of the combined water, wastewater and stormwater flow is captured at treatment plants. However, Heavy rain occasionally exceeds the capacity of the wastewater treatment plants, causing direct discharge of untreated sewage into rivers, streams, and other local water bodies. Under a 2005 consent order, DEP is required to reduce combined sewer overflow CSOs from New York City's sewer system in order to improve the water quality of its surrounding waterways. In 2012, the city signed a new consent order with the DEC to address direct discharge of untreated sewage into water bodies, and DEC proposed a number of measures to comply with the consent order. These measures include the development of 11 long-term control plans and the installation of a hybrid of gray and green infrastructure. LTCPs use green and gray infrastructure in order to address, measure, and reduce the effect of CSOs. Gray infrastructure includes large-scale centralized or end-of-pipe controls, such as retention tanks or sewer modification. Some of the long-term control plans have not been developed yet. For others, the use of chlorine has created concern among advocates. The DEP is currently committing to spending $4 million a week, every week, for the next 25 years to make New York City's surface waters fishable and swimmable, but more can always be done. Today we will hear from the administration and the advocates regarding additional steps that may be taken that are equitable, scientifically sustainable, and achievable to meet the goals of the Clean Water Act. Uh, and now we'll go to cool. Council Member Kuhl, who has a statement he wants to read. Uh, he represents Flushing, and then we will uh, begin the hearing. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chair, uh, Acting Chair uh, Donovan Richards. And thank you for all the commissioners and engineers in here to testify. Uh, my name is Peter Ku. I represent Council District 20. Uh, we have the Flushing Creek, which is known as one of the city's most polluted waterways. The Flushing Bay and the Creek combined have the highest amount of CSO outfall in the city, about 3 billion, 3 billion gallons per year. Not, billion, not million, 3 billion with a B. The city has proposed connecting uh, 25 million 
get a storage tunnel to the flushing bay to handle, the, uh, hand to handle its overflows, but the flushing creek is being overloaded. Instead of capacity, the flushing creek will be coordinated and unproven toxic solution that just cover up the raw sewage with another toxic chemical, except this one smells better. You use chlorine in a swimming pool to kill bacteria, not a creek where you want to encourage wildlife. There's a really basic principle of urban planning that I feel like is being ignored when it comes to addressing the pollution in the flushing creek. The surrounding community is undergoing a wave of unprecedented development without any uh, insight being put into how the surge in new po population will affect our sewers. Fashion Creek cannot bear this burden. I will not bear this burden either as a council member. We want to develop the waterfront. We want to create open spaces that can be enjoyed by our community. We want to create access. None of this can happen unless this administration commits to capturing overflows. As of today, there's zero access to the creek, so it's easier to get away with a plan that allows pollution to flourish away from the public eye. But I'm here today to say that the future is now and the future to create a sustainable waterfront is now. So, uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask a few questions before I leave for my committee meetings? Yeah. Okay, give it to them first, okay. Yeah, all right. All right, you may begin. Uh, please state your name for the record, and Samara will swear you in. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. I do. Good morning, council members Richards and Ku. I am Angela Licata, Deputy Commissioner of Sustainability for New York City's Department of Environmental Protection. And joining me today are Acting Deputy Commissioner Jim Muller and Mikhail Adgate, Director of Air Stormwater Management Outreach, as well as other members of the department, namely Deputy Commissioner Pam Alardo. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on current condition of future plans of New York City's wastewater infrastructure. Protecting the waterways and environment and public health of New York City are central to DEP's mission. Today, water quality in New York Harbor is better than it has been in over 100 years, and crucial to bringing the harbor to its current state has been over $12 billion in investments that DEP has completed since 2002. These projects include wastewater treatment plant upgrades, sewer separation and sewer system upgrades, combined sewer overflow abatement, green infrastructure, wetland restoration, nutrient removal from wastewater, and hundreds of, of additional projects. In approximately 60% of the cities, the sewers combined sanitary flow created each time we turn on a tap, flush a toilet, or use a water discharging appliance. When that mixes with stormwater and enters the sewer system, when it rains, a combined sewer overflow may be created. The system serves an essential role in protecting public health and the environment. During some rain events, while functioning as designed, the system becomes overburdened. When this occurs, the mix of stormwater and untreated wastewater may discharge, as we stated, to create a combined sewer overflow to protect the treatment plant processes. Between the 1970s and 2011, over $40 billion was invested to build two wastewater treatment plants and upgrade treatment processes in the other 12 wastewater treatment plants in New York City. These projects were critical for the growth and development of the city and reduced CSO volumes flowing into the harbor by 82%. We see the benefits of these investments as the city's residents reconnect with the waters and marine life and oyster restoration projects once again begin to thrive in our surrounding waterways. Ideally, we would like to reduce CSOs by 100%. However, we acknowledge that CSOs still present a challenge, especially for smaller man-made tributaries that have no natural currents or tidal flows. 
DEP working under a 2012 consent order with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is required to develop 11 long-term control plans, which are comprehensive evaluations of long-term solutions to reduce CSO events and to continue to improve the water quality in New York City's water bodies. Each long-term control plan, or LTCP, is unique and built upon earlier in investments and projects to develop approaches for each water body to achieve ac applicable New York State water quality standards. LTCPs are or will be implemented using a hybrid green and gray infrastructure approach to address, measure, and mitigate the effects of combined sewer overflows. Prior to the long-term control plan submittals, DEP committed over $4.1 billion towards combined sewer overflow control. This includes $2.6 billion in commitments towards gray infrastructure and $1.5 billion towards green infrastructure. Gray infrastructure projects include tanks, tunnels, sewer separations, weir modifications, and floatable litter control. In 2017, DEC approved seven of our long-term control plans, and two plans are currently under review by the state. With these nine plans, DEP is prepared to spend an additional $4.4 billion over the next 25 years to continue to mitigate the impacts of combined sewer overflows. That means total investments in CSO abatement are at least $8.5 billion. Two additional plans are under development for submittal in calendar year 2018, and the cost associated with those plans to mitigate CSOs has yet to be determined. The nine submitted plans include a wide range of CSO mitigation projects, including two storage tunnels, one for Flushing Bay and the other for Newtown Creek, ranging in diameter from 18 feet to 30 feet. These tunnels provide for both conveyance and storage of combined sewer overflow, and the contents of the tunnels will be pumped back to the wastewater treatment plants after storm events. These projects require less permanent above ground property than storage tanks, and we minimize surface construction impacts through this method. Two sewer system improvement projects are proposed, one for the Bronx River and the other as a component of the Newtown Creek long-term control plan. In Newtown Creek, we have proposed expanding the existing Borden Avenue pump station to increase capture rates and direct more flow to the plant. For the Bronx River, sewer modifications will create additional capacity while reducing overflows into the river. Both of these projects leverage existing infrastructure in order to control costs and enhance capture rates. The long-term control plans for Alley Creek, Flushing Creek, and Hutchinson River utilize disinfection of combined sewer overflow discharges with chlorine during the recreational season. And DEP will also construct dechlorination facilities to remove any excess chlorine residual. It is important to highlight that in Alley Creek and Flushing Creek, early investments in CSO storage tanks resulted in substantial reductions in CSO volumes. And leveraging these existing tanks as chlorine contact tanks enables the disinfection process to have adequate detention times to achieve bacterial kills, also makes these alternatives extremely cost effective. Disinfecting CSOs will further reduce bacteria into all three water bodies and will significantly improve water quality during the recreational season. Many municipalities across the country, including cities in Vermont, Michigan, California, and Washington, disinfect combined sewer overflows using chlorination or a combination of chlorination, dechlorination. Based on our data, and modeling, the long-term control plan projects identified thus far will bring key water quality indicators such as dissolved oxygen, which is important for ecological health, and fecal coliform, an indicator of sewage-related pollution, into compliance with existing state water quality standards nearly 100% of the time during the recreational season. All nine water bodies will be fishable, swimmable under existing standards for those time periods. DEP's $1.5 billion green infrastructure program is one of the most ambitious green infrastructure programs in the country. DEP works with the departments of Parks and Recreation, Transportation and Design and Construction, and the Economic Development Corporation to saturate priority watersheds with rain gardens and city-owned streets and sidewalks. As part of the program, DEP has also invested in green jobs, creating over 50 new maintenance positions and training staff to care for the rain gardens. DEP also conducts research and development and tracks the performance of green infrastructure to better understand how it works to reduce the urban heat island effect and improve air quality. 
In addition, working with partner agencies, DEP has 54 sites where often large green infrastructure projects are in construction or completed at parks, playgrounds, schools, and New York City Housing Authority complexes. DEP has hundreds of other sites that are in design or under construction for con with partner agencies. These partnerships with our sister agencies are critical. Not only are we reducing impervious area and managing stormwater, we are contributing to important community, community amenities and programs such as the Parks Department's Community Parks Initiative. DEP has also distributed over 15 million through its grant program to private property owners and is developing new private incentive program to encourage green infrastructure on non-city owned property. Many remarkable projects have been completed thus far as part of the Green Infrastructure Grant Program, including Brooklyn Navy Yard, Green Roof and Farm, Queens College Common Spaces, Bishop Lachlan High School Green Roof, and the New School Green Roof. In addition to the works to reduce CSOs, DEP is also leading a multi-agency effort to develop a New York City stormwater management program to control stormwater runoff in the 40% of the city that is served by separated sewers. In these areas, one pipe sends sanitary waste to the treatment plan for treatment, while the other sends stormwater to a nearby water body. As you can imagine, this stormwater can pick up many pollutants as it washes over industrial property, streets and sidewalks, or construction sites. This program, known as the MS4, combined with our long-term control plan efforts, reflects integrated watershed management that relies on highly scientific data collection and analysis, creative urban planning assessments, foundational engineering practices, and principles from around the country, and innovative financing as we seek to leverage existing capital projects and programs while maintaining a state of good repair. In summary, we have committed $4.1 billion, including green infrastructure, to reducing CSOs and are now prepared to spend an additional $4.4 billion on the approved long-term control plans on what we believe to be cost-effective projects that achieve significant water quality benefits. In an ideal world, with unlimited resources and with consideration of the impact on water rate and our ratepayers, we could consider investing even more ratepayer dollars to further reduce CSO discharges. However, it is important to note that our best estimates show that achieving 100% CSO control would cost nearly $30 billion, yet still not achieve all of the applicable water quality standards due to a number of factors, including the nature of our urban tributaries. This would impose a substantial burden on our ratepayers with limited benefits and, as I will describe, would crowd out investing in other projects to ensure that our current assets are properly maintained and to protect our critical water supply needs. As we celebrate the 175th anniversary of the opening of the Croton Aqueduct and supply over a billion gallons of water to 9 million New Yorkers every day, it is not surprising that DEP oversees a capital-intensive process and one of the largest capital programs in the region. In April 2017, Mayor de Blasio announced DEP's $18 billion capital plan for fiscal years 18 through 27, which represents a $3 billion increase over the 2015 10-year plan. The additional funding is primarily for service improvements, regulatory mandates, and sustainability. For example, the costliest dependability projects in our FY18 through FY27 10-year plan are the Kensico Eastview Connection Tunnel at $1.2 billion, completion of City Tunnel No. 3, Stage 2 in Brooklyn and Queens at $600 million, and the Catswell Aqueduct Repair and Rehabilitation at $155 million. While DEP is making and planning considerable investments in important capital projects, including reducing CSOs, we also look to keep our rates as affordable as possible. Nevertheless, rates have risen, and at the same time, household income has been stagnant for nearly 30 years. We need to keep in mind our ratepayers' ability to fund our operations and investments without putting undue burden on them. This is especially challenging as regulations and mandated projects have increased and federal assistance has declined to nearly zero. Rates were relatively flat until 2000 when DEP was required to embark on a number of mandated projects and the system needed critical state of good repair projects. Adjusted for inflation, rates have risen 160% since 1990 
and rates nearly doubled between 2006 and 2016. Beyond stagnant incomes, other costs for DEP customers have risen too. Housing, food, and health care have all risen faster than inflation. This is all a significant challenge to our customers. Currently, approximately 20% of households pays more than 4.5% of their income for water and sewer. And by the year 2030, this number could rise to more than 30% of households paying over 4.5% of household income on water and wastewater services. The system maintains a four-year forecast of anticipated increases in water and sewer rates. The current forecast, which spans fiscal years 2019 through 2022, indicates an annual water and sewer rate increase of nearly 3.3%, totaling a 13.8% rate increase during this four-year period. This means that over the next four fiscal years, our rates are expected to grow faster than the Federal Reserve's 2% annual inflation target which would mean a cumulative increase of 8.2% over four years. The current rate forecast is based on the city's four-year capital plan for DEP released in April 2017. Additions to this capital plan, such as funds for an expanded set of CSOs, would result in higher forecasts for future rate increases. In addition, since approximately 60% of the system revenues are applied toward debt-related service, the level of future rate increases also depends on the cost of the system of issuing debt. Higher market rates of interest or unfavorable changes to the federal income tax code would also result in higher than forecasted increases to water and sewer rates. DEP looks to control costs and structure debt in a conservative manner that reduces the financial impact of significant investments such as the five billion Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plan upgrades on our ratepayers. As a result, DEP has been able to keep water and wastewater charges to a little over one cent per gallon, about average for U.S. cities. That said, legal mandates have real and significant impacts on ratepayers' pocketbooks. Mandated projects can also compromise consistent investment in state of good repair and other important investments as we look to control costs. In fact, in um, FY 2017, mandates cost average homeowners approximately $229 per year of their total water bill, water wastewater bill. As the nation's largest water utility, we work to be good stewards of the environment around us by maintaining and expanding the network of main sewer pipes and wastewater treatment plants that comprise the city's sewer system while remaining conscious of the rates our customers pay. Balancing the costs and benefits of each planned project is critical to our work and we are confident that we will continue to see significant improvements in all of the waters where New Yorkers live, work, learn and play. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify and we will be glad to answer any questions. Well, thank you for your testimony. I'm going to go to Councilmember Cool because he has a hearing at 11, so I wanted to uh, give him an opportunity to ask a few questions. Thank you, Chair uh, Richards. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, New York City waterways and sewer systems are very complicated, you know. Uh, uh, I recently went to Hong Kong, uh, which is, um, I think, is similar size to New York City and surrounded by all waters, too. I don't, and whenever you rain there, uh, they, they don't cause a bad like, like here. Uh, so I asked people one, uh, and they said, oh, we, we don't see uh, like water damage after a hurricane as, like, compared with like, 20 or 30 years ago. So they did a very big improvement there. So I hope New York City can learn from them and do something similar. Um, so I have a few questions, just five of them. Uh, with with uh, pertaining most to my local area, uh, which is Flushing Creek. Uh, so the first one is, how does the city determine whether to coordinate or build infrastructure? This is really easy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yes and no. Um, it's a simple question, but a little bit more difficult to explain. We do a very thorough cost-benefit analysis. And in the case of Flushing Creek, we looked at the existing storage that we have in place and the potential for 
us to meet the targeted water quality criteria using a cost-effective um, de uh, disinfection and dechlorination process. Okay. So, uh, so how much money would it take to bring CSOs in Flushing Creek under control? And what has to be done to allocate that money? We actually, we actually have projected what it would cost to get 100% CSO control citywide, and that was the $30 billion estimate that I gave you. Um, but we did look at alternatives for Flushing Creek as well. And if I, I can find that number. Yeah, so the 100% treatment or capture um, for Flushing Creek would have been $5 billion alone. $5 billion. Dollars. So, so what it takes to do, is it really hard to allocate that money, that amount of money? So, you know, one of the things I think we all notice is that we are a water-rich city, as you indicated, Council Member. Um, there's over 520 miles of waterway or waterfront in New York City. And one of the issues and challenges, I mean, that's a great gift that we have so much water surrounding our city, but the challenge is that the spending and investments that we make get dispersed citywide. So the amount that we are spending on the overall CSO program is in excess of $8 billion at this point in time. So adding an additional $5 billion, let's say, and we would discount by the investments that we're already making in Flushing Creek, would um, bring that figure to around $13 billion. And, and that's what we're trying to control. We're trying to control those costs, and we're trying to um, make those investments citywide as much as possible and bring all of our water bodies forward into a state of um, water quality improvement. Okay, so, so uh, how about the city's opinion on coordinating uh, different so greatly from that of other professors and scientists of environmental and water quality who advise against it? Well, we acknowledge that um, chlorinating uh, storm flows will be challenging, and that's why we are also proposing the dechlorination so that we can minimize chlorine residual levels as we are concerned about the ecosystem health in these water bodies. Um, as you indicated, that is one of the main reasons why we're making these improvements is to increase the habitat value in the water bodies as well as increase human access to the water bodies. Um, as part of the project, oh we will be undertaking an environmental impact assessment. And as part of that process, we'll do a thorough evaluation of risks and benefits. So. So I, I only have one more question. Yeah. So what evidence do you have that source coordination will not have a detrimental effect on wildlife like the native oysters and fishing populations. Like for human beings, we always worry about like overcooling the bacteria. You know, the chickens are fed with antibiotics, our cattle are being fed with antibiotics. And, and if you do dump chlorine in the, in the waterway, uh, it not only kills bad bacteria, it also kills all the good bacteria, all the you know, living organisms around uh, the rough and the grid, which is good for nature. Just like our body, we overkill with antibiotics, and now everybody's taking probiotics, you know? So, so maybe, you know, that's not good, you know, because now we, you know, we have to take probiotics every day because we're taking antibiotics too much. So I think this is the same consequence we have to face, you know, if you use too much chlorine in the water quick, you know? So how do we answer that? So again, you know, we are proposing to dechlorinate as well, and we will be measuring 
um, and for a period of time establishing very stringent protocols for how to apply the and the the dosage rates of the chlorine and how effective the dechlorination is in order to maintain the minimal um, residual chlorine rates in the receiving water body. So that will have to be very carefully balanced. So will have to be very stringent protocols applied to that application, and we will have to monitor the receiving water's residual chlorine. Thank you, uh, Council Member Kuhl. Okay, let's hop into, so I, I feel like we're, and I want to thank you for the work that you, you obviously are doing. I feel like we're, we're chasing our tail, though. How much would it cost the city to actually uh, rebuild the entire sewage system in the city uh, so that wastewater and stormwater systems are completely separate? How much would that cost us, and how long would it take for something like this to happen? Because, uh, you know, chlorine and all of these things are, I don't want to say the word, but they're, they're good remedies, but obviously the issue is our system and the way the system is designed. So has there been any thought process in how we completely uh, stop wasting money to a great degree and really think of a, a, a real strategy on how to make sure uh, the system is different? So it's a great question. Again, my name is Jim Muller, Acting Deputy Commissioner of the Bureau you can just speak of a little higher into your construction. Mind. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Loud. So it's, in terms of separating the system, it's something we've looked at um, in a lot of different places, driven by a lot of different um, issues. Sometimes flooding might drive that and, and trying to relieve that in local areas. In terms of CSO, it's something we've also looked at in terms of sewer separation. And Right now, our recommended plans is very similar to the question on storage versus disinfection. It's opportunistic. So we'll do high levels uh, storm sewer separation. We're driven by topography, the, the local geography, and the low points and the high points and where we can outlet. So sometimes it's just not feasible to build a separate outlet system into waterways because of there could be a subway in the way. There could be, you know, different Has that been studied, though, there? before we make that? I'm sorry? Before you make that, we've looked uh, at it in, in, in various areas. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. It's something so we, so we do look at, um, and those those are the kind of the feasibility issues that come into place, whether we had the money or not. Is it so? Even there's been a comprehensive feasibility feasibility study on this particular issue, or are we just saying there could be a train in a way without a comprehensive study? Yeah, we haven't done a system-wide comprehensive study. Sounds like a bill. At your requesting. However, we, I think we have avoided um, the concept that we could do this system-wide because, as you indicated, Council Member, it would be a very long time frame um, in order for us to do that. There are so many conflicts in the streets um, that in order for us to build new sewers, we would have to move other utilities out of the way. So the price tag would be extremely high. And the other concern that we have, particularly lately, is that separated storm sewers cannot take advantage of our treatment plants. So while the CSOs do occur, and they occur regularly, for the majority of our uh, rainwater or precipitation events, um, that are not the larger storms, we receive the benefit of wastewater treatment. So when you have a separate storm uh, pipe, you would have no um, effluent treatment um, if you didn't build that into the, the system that you were developing. And we have concerns about that because there are other pollutants that run off the urban environment that we will be addressing as part of our municipal um, separate storm sewer system permit the MS-4 permit that we described in the testimony. So I understand. I understand Rome was not built in one day either. Um, I am interested in DEP looking at a, a feasibility study on how to get this done. And, and perhaps it'll just be a blueprint, but I think we need to start somewhere. Maybe the next council member in 20 years or 30 years will finally get this done. But but in all honesty, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here. One of the other issues uh, we've heard a lot about is the issue around transparency, um, when storm water runoff occurs. Can you tell me how is the public alerted to uh, storm water runoff uh, when it does occur? Um, gladly. Mikkel Adgate is prepared a response to that anticipated question, so I will oh, defer really? to her. Oh, really? Anticipating our questions. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm I, doing I, your I homework. I'm, I'm very impressed because some agencies actually don't. So this is this is good. 
Well, I think that we have the benefit of um, connecting regularly with our stakeholders, many of whom are, are here today. Um, and so we've been able to hear their concerns. Um, but in terms of um, what we call our CSO notification system or our, our advisory system, um, right now that system is based on a model. So um, depending on the rain event, um, it projects if a CSO event could have happened. Um, so it's not based on real-time data collection. We don't have um, sort of analysis happening in every single CSO outfall. Um, but New Yorkers are able to either go onto our website um, where we have a water body advisory page and that's updated hourly, rain or shine, based on that model. Um, or they can sign up for Notify NYC alerts. So that could be by so text. So Notify NYC, I was going to bring that up. So, yes. So, you, so if I sign up, there's an option for me to select the specific option and it comes to my phone. That's to alert me. Mm -hmm. and How many people are signed up? for this particular? I don't have an answer to that question. How, what sort of outreach has DEP done uh, to ensure the public is aware of this option outside of the advocates? Because they, you know, they live this, they breathe it, they drink it. Um, how do we ensure that everyday New York is outside of individuals who are very engaged in this conversation uh, have an opportunity to be aware of what's going on around them? So we are regularly meeting with community boards and elected officials. All righty. Those are people who everyday New York, and mm -hmm. they are everyday New Yorkers too, but people who are not engaged in government and their civic association, how does everyday New Yorkers get the opportunity to know that they can sign up for an alert on this? So I think there has to be at least some point of connection with the agency. So it's not that we are disseminating flyers to um, every New Yorker, um, but for those who are likely to be interacting with a water body, they can hear about it either from our website, from our social media accounts where we talk about notification and advisories. And also, um, you know, one component that I haven't mentioned yet, which is the advisories that come through the state, which is the NIA alert system. So what I've described so mm -hmm. far is for the CSO advisories, mm -hmm. but I think you may be aware that um, the state passed the sewage pollution right to know law back in 2013. Mm -hmm. And for other types of discharges, maybe that would be like a bypass or we confirm an illicit connection. The agency reports that to the state um, and then again, people can sign up for the state alert system. We've had a lot of conversations with the state about that system because we know many of um, our constituents find the city's system easier to interact with, whether it's Notify NYC or our website updates. Um, and so what we're looking to do is assess all of the water body systems now, um, get agency and public feedback in order to develop some detailed recommendations for improving those notification systems so that we can come up with strategies that sort of rec reconcile how they differ, but also to your point, council member, connect with New Yorkers in a way that they may not have a, had a chance to connect with us before. All right, so what I would suggest is we all get a DEP bill, at least I do, um, and uh, perhaps that should go in whatever you're mailing or, or if you sign up for the online notification, you know, you put on would you like to receive a notification uh, about stormwater runoff incidents? DEP open to that? I, I mean, I think Not that I like reading my bill, by the way. <laughs> um, I think that we're always interested in feedback on how we can improve, so we can certainly take that back um, and evaluate it. I think that would be an a easy idea to really implement. Um, all right, so we talked about, uh, and I still didn't get a, a total cost on how much it would cost to build out the system. So we, I know I talked about a feasibility study, but you don't have an, a guesstimate of how much it would cost if we were to 
build out? No, we don't have a comprehensive study of a sewer separation Alrighty. program, but I would suggest that if we were going to do such a study, we might want to concentrate in one watershed or one tributary area just to get a sense of what that looks like rather than um, extrapolating for the entire city because I think potentially focusing in on one watershed would give us an indication of what that would look like prospectively. Okay, that's a start. Um, so DEP's committed $4.1 billion in your testimony you, you spoke of, including green infrastructure uh, to reduce CSOs. How much of that money has actually been spent? The green infrastructure I'm very fresh on. We have spent 450 and we have about another 930 in the four-year plan. So we're approaching almost $1.4 Four billion. And what's the total to allocated on green? The total allocated for the green infrastructure program is 1.5 billion. And we have incurred costs of 2.6 billion for the gray projects. That's part of the programs that we've already um, committed to in terms of the gray infrastructure. That's before the long-term control plan commitments. And um, so, in, in, can you go through, so I, the, the total plan is 18.1 billion, correct? That's our capital program. That's your capital program. Um, and can you go through uh, what is covered under the 18.1? Certainly. On that slide. Okay. So, I mean, essentially we've talked about some of what we consider our dependability program, and that really is our water supply um, resiliency program. So those are uh, uh, namely some of the projects that we're doing upstate to ensure redundancy and resiliency, um, as well as city tunnel improvements, so for distribution of drinking water supply within the city. Um, we have over two billion, and that's about 11% of that uh, projected $18 billion budget. Um, we have- You uh, said you have two billion, you spent two billion or you have- Proposed. Proposed two billion. Mm -hmm. This is FY 2018 to uh, FY 2027, the 10 year capital program. Okay of about $18.1 billion, so out of that, about $2 billion in dependability projects, water supply drinking water projects, which is about 11.1%. And then we have sewer construction, um, over $4.3 billion allocated there for either new sewer construction or upgrading sewers. Mm -hmm. and that's about 23% of the budget. Water main construction, which we like to do for the water mains that are um, aged, uh, that's about $2 billion, another 11% of the budget allocated for that purpose. And for our mandated projects, we have in this 10-year program about $3.5 billion, or about 19% okay. of the allocated budget. And finally, with respect to state of good repair, very important component of our budget. We have a lot of facilities that are now 50, and, uh, 50 to 100 years old, and we want to either have a cycle of replacement for them or we need to upgrade equipment. Upgrading that equipment will ensure that we have efficiencies with respect to energy and greenhouse gas reduction as we modernize those facilities as well, so we get a lot of synergy there. And that's about $5.7 billion, or 31% of the budget. Uh, okay, so that sounds great. Now, how did, you, how did we uh, engage the public in a lot of these conversations? So there are a lot of advocates in this room, um, and I'm interested in knowing, did we take any input from them? Uh, how did DEP uh, consult with the public on this plan? Uh, so can you speak to that? Well, I, um, we have budget hearings on a yearly basis as well as city we, council budget hearings city council budget okay. hearings as well as with respect to the portions of the project that are discretionary um we have made decisions um regarding where we think we have to uh think where we actually have data about flooding 
Um, we have data about uh, street work that's necessary to do with the Department of Transportation. So sometimes just by having um, coupling projects where we have roadway reconstruction and sewer work together, that increases efficiency. So we may allocate budget there. Um, and uh, specifically with regard to public participation on the mandated projects, we have um, many, many meetings with the um, public regarding our CSO long-term control plan program. So throughout that process, we have been providing information on our projected rates. We have included a financial capability analysis within each of our long-term control plans, indicating um, the revenues needed and the projected uh, capital budget going forward, not only the four and 10 years, but we've even tried to um, project out even further. Sounds good. So did we take input from? We have received a lot of input on that, namely that we should be spending more money on combined sewer overflow programming. Okay, and I and, know, okay. Oh, um, sorry, Council Member, if I could just add on to that. I think some of that engagement isn't necessarily branded as a capital planning engagement strategy. So for instance, you know that we are very plugged into Southeast Queens and community concerns about flooding. Um, and so that dialogue between the community and the city resulted in our Southeast Queens plan. And so that's incorporated into this capital budget. It's a way for us to sort of get feedback from our constituents without necessarily calling it a budgetary exercise. So it's a way for folks to engage with us in the way that they deem most important based on how they are um, dealing with flooding or interacting with their waterways. Right, and I know seven plans were approved, so can you just speak to how we're engaging the public uh, with the seven approvals that have come forward? Well, uh, as we just indicated. And it's okay if you don't have an answer, let's No, I, I think we do. I, the pathway. answer <laughs> would be, again, as stated, that we and do. Don't, and, and, and not to cut you off, but city council hearings are great. We'll we do the, the budget hearings twice, at least two hearings. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about more so locally focused. How do we get into communities and have conversations with mm -hmm. those uh, absolutely right. being affected by these plans. So that's more so what I'm looking to hear. Okay. Uh, yeah, so DB. what we have been doing is, uh, again, we have these local water body meetings under the long-term control plans. Public meetings? They are public meetings, yes. Um, so when we have, let's say, a Flushing Creek project, we'll do at least two, if not three meetings locally within the Flushing Creek watershed. And we also have a citywide once a year annual meeting on the overall long-term control plan. So that is, um, you know, refined to one aspect of the capital program, but within that context, we have started to incorporate a broader view of the agency's capital programming, the implications of that programming on our rates and revenues and rate payers. And let me, so let me ask the question more lasered. So, these seven approvals, are you going to do seven different meetings or how, with the public or how are you engaging the public? Oh, and you so get where I'm going with this. I, I do, so, sure you know, that's, that's a really great aware. question and that has definitely been um, a part of contention, I, I think, or a point of contention with the stakeholders. Um, the way the process has worked for public participation with respect to the long-term control plans is our last public meeting is a meeting to review the alternatives that we've developed. And we give um, pros and cons, if you will, of each alternative and the um, cost implications of those alternatives. But we don't have a final meeting. Then we submit what we believe to be the approvable plan to New York State DEC. And heretofore, we have not, the city has not provided the public input on the long-term control plan um, before we pick a proposed project and submit it to the state DEC. And is there a reason for that? Not a good one. So we would, <laughs> so. She can be trusted because she was <laughs> under oath and she told the truth, all right? We don't get that all the time. I appreciate you being honest. So moving forward, how do we ensure that we engage the public in this conversation because the council has uh, 
interest in that. And uh, for local council members who also are affected by this issue, they would love to engage their constituents, the ratepayers. How do we keep the ratepayers out of the conversation? Right. So, I mean, you're absolutely correct, and we acknowledge that we can improve this part of the process. So we have two long-term control plans to go for the Jamaica Bay um, and its tributaries. We are proposing to build in the time frame to propose the project that we prefer with all the rationale to the public and get their feedback before the plan is submitted to DEC. And we will do the same thing for the citywide long-term control plan. We don't want to have to legislate to mandate public meetings. So, you know, it would be a shame if we had to actually draft a bill on requiring DEP to hold public meetings with ratepayers, customers uh, on these plans. So I'm going to go to Councilmember Torres, and, and then I'll come back with a few other questions. Thank you. I, along with Councilmember Salamanca, I, my district includes the Bronx River. And even though I'm hardly an expert on the subject matter, I am concerned about CSOs and the impact it has in making the Bronx River um, less safe for human recreation, less habitable for wildlife. I, I have a simple question. How, how do, you know, the city is required under the Clean Water Act to create an LTCP. And how do I explain to my constituents that an LTCP that continues to allow hundreds of millions of gallons of, of water sewage into the Bronx River is consistent with the goal of making the Bronx River safer for recreation and wildlife? How do I reconcile those two facts? It's, it's a really difficult um, question, and I would propose this as a response, which is to say that ultimately we would like to achieve 100% reduction in combined sewer overflows. If the city was planning a, a wastewater system today, that would certainly not be an acceptable way of eliminating our waste. Having said that, this is a legacy system, and we are now trying to build out over time what is a cost-effective way of remedying a problem. It's frankly a challenge that we have all inherited. So we are trying to develop plans that have a fair pace of investment along with all of the other challenges that we face and to remedy that water quality problem utilizing cost-effective measures and in a way that creates compliance with current or existing water quality standards. So we think these water bodies, and this is really tough because we, as we go forward and make these improvements, we've also, our tolerance for water quality degradation has been much reduced, right? So we, we don't have a high tolerance any longer for sewage fouling up our waterways. So with that problem to tackle, we continue to tell our constituents it's not safe to go near the water or here's a caution or here's an advisory. At the same time, the water has gotten much cleaner. So this is a, this is a difficult message and we appreciate that and we could certainly work with you, but that, that's where we are. We have put forward a pace of investment that we think is practical that we think resolves a fair bit of the problem, and we certainly don't see ourselves as completed at the end of the day. Um, the Clean Water Act is a very aspirational um, water quality uh, goals that are stated there, are swimmable, fishable. The best is it meant as an aspiration or is it a mandate? And are we in compliance with that mandate? We are in compliance with projected uh, with these projects. We will be in compliance. Are we presently with, in compliance? or No. We are not. We are not. And so at what point will we come into compliance with? When these long-term control plans are completed, we're anticipating or predicting nearly 100% compliance with the existing water quality standards. That's what, that's what the modeling has, has indicated. And that's how we have set the program. That's how we have developed the program. So you acknowledge the status quo is problematic. Instead of capturing CSOs, your plan proposes to either chlorinate or divert CSOs. When it comes to Alley Creek, Flushing Creek, and Hutchinson River, the city proposes chlorinating CSOs. When it comes to the Bronx River, the city proposes diverting CSOs to the East River. Has chlorination proven to be effective 
at rendering our waterways safer for recreation and wildlife? Is that a proven strategy? I'm, I wanted to uh, turn this over to my colleague Jim Muller, who has um, experience, has visited some of these other facilities, and also has done some investigation as to where um, else they are doing um, chlorination and disinfection. So great questions again. We've looked nationally at what folks are doing at different municipalities and chlorination and followed by dechlorination and in some cases they're just chlorinating. They are not dechlorinating so that chlorine is going out into the waterway. Um, we're not taking that approach here. We're recommending dechlorination at the three water bodies as you're accurately stating. For Bronx River, we thought the better opportunity, rather, we're not just defaulting to chlorination as a, as a cost-effective alternative for every water body. Uh, for Bronx River, we thought the more cost-effective thing to do was get it out of the water body and diverting it to the East River and also to the, to the Hunts Point treatment plant for treatment. Uh, so it's a balance there in terms of the size of the storm uh, where the East River can certainly handle that capacity much better. In terms of water quality compliance, for large areas of the, of the harbor, we are actually in compliance with existing standards, uh, even with the, uh, based on the fecal, uh, DEC's new rulemaking last year on fecal. So for large parts of the, or the harbor today, we are in uh, compliance. Um, those tributaries that uh, Angela spoke about earlier, they're the tough, they are the tough locations in the harbor. So most of the area of the harbor is not in the tributaries, they're smaller, but they are much tougher. It's for the reasons you all know, that they're confined, there's not a lot of uh, flushing back and forth with the open, open ocean and the open harbor. So those are trickier. So for Bronx River, again, we thought the opportunity there to divert that flow to the interceptor, try to get more flow to the Hunts Point treatment plant. For the larger storms, it'll overflow into the East River. But the East River has a lot more assimilative capacity than the Bronx but, River, as you, as you know. Uh, before, and, we, we, before we speak about diversion, I want to, I'm not sure if I heard an answer to, oh, to, to the, the question. So we, is that, so we, has there been a study that has shown that chlorination is an effective strategy for improving water quality? There's case studies in terms of other municipalities who are using this. It's, it's an industry standard that's set, you know, national. No, I know there are municipalities using it, but has yep. it been shown to be effective at I achieving the goal of improving water quality? Yeah, I believe so, <laughs> yes. Okay. Because one concern I have is that with chlorination, you're injecting a chemical into bodies of water. How can we be sure that we're not doing more harm than good? Right, so the dechlorination piece that Angela's talking about is, is aimed at reducing that ac the actual chlorine that is, is there 100 percent dechlorination or is it partial it's, dechlorination or there's a residual there's still a, a small residual okay. but there is still a residual and, and do we know if that residual effect is making matters worse that I think as Angela stated that for each of these projects for the three projects you mentioned we will be looking at the environmental impacts okay. so it sounds like there's some uncertainty around the the implications of chlorination Sure. Okay. <laughs> Based on your response. Sure. Um, d what is the impact of the diversion of sewage overflows into the East River? Uh, what impact will it have on the water quality of the East River? I imagine well, it's a problem. Right. As Deputy Commissioner um, Muller indicated, we have done the assessment of what that um, relocation would do. And because the East River is a much wider, broader, deeper water body, that um, has the assimilative capacity to pick up that additional flow and would not um, adversely affect that water body's ability to achieve the water quality standards. Did you formulate the, the strategic plan in partnership with community-based organizations like the Bronx River? Because the impression that I get from the Bronx River Alliance is that there was a lack of engagement. Yeah, that, I, I mean, that's somewhat unfortunate that folks feel that way, although we did acknowledge that um, I think where we really fell short is in not providing an opportunity to give feedback on the final plan that was submitted to DEC, but we had many meetings, I myself was there, um, to discuss the Bronx River proposals and alternatives that we were considering with the public. Um, and they did express their concerns, to be fair, 
about chlorination alternatives. So we did, we did hear those concerns. Nevertheless, we proposed that as the project because it was, again, the cost-effective solution um, to that problem. Additional storage there may have meant that we would wait a much longer period of time for water quality improvements either there in the Bronx River or elsewhere in another water body because we just can't put that much more capital investment through this 10-year program or this four-year program as you heard us testify. Something else would have to give. And on balance, we don't feel that we can put aside some of the other priorities we have for sewer upgrades, for um, water, drinking water dependability projects, for state of good repair projects. So we are trying to maintain some um, you know, uh, cap or some uh, limits on this 10-year capital program so we don't adversely affect our ratepayers. And having said that, we've already increased that budget quite a bit from the last uh, approved budget. And council member, if I could just elaborate a little bit on what DC Lakata has been sharing also in regards to council member Richard's earlier question and sort of take a step back to give a full picture of our public participation strategy. Back in 2012, we released a public participation plan um, that as DC Lakata said, called for three meetings for each water body. So for all nine LTCPs that have been submitted, each one of them had what's called a kickoff meeting where we talked about the water body characteristics, we shared the data analysis and the collection that we had conducted. Um, all of them also had what's called an alternatives meeting where we gave the most up-to-date information about what types of projects were being looked at for that particular water body. And we shared it um, for a wide range of CSO control. So we looked at sort of the 25%, 50%, and then also the 100% CSO control. What would those projects look like? What would the cost be? So those were two public meetings that were had in addition to meeting with community board Boards, neighborhood associations, some of the environmental organizations that are represented today because we wanted to share essentially the latest thinking that was taking place as these plans were being developed and get feedback. After that alternatives meeting, the public was encouraged to not only review our presentations but also send us comments about the alternatives that were presented. So they were able to actually look at that latest thinking and say, okay, in this particular situation, we're, we're okay with this, we're not okay with that. And then we would review those comment letters before the final LTCP was submitted to the state. Um, throughout that process, we have tried to be very responsive to the community's feedback about the public participation strategy. Although I just wanna, and I'm not, I'm sure there was several levels of engagement, but it, it seems odd to me. I'm, I'm curious, why, why did DEP decide to seek approval for a final plan without presenting it to community-based organizations that are deeply invested in the process. Is that here's the plan, here's our strategic plan for improving water quality over the next decade. We're about to seek approval from the state. What do you think? Like, why would you forego that process? It seems odd. So, I mean, essentially, as we were saying, we have to look in balance at the total capital programming, for not only for the other long-term control plan projects, we have 11 water bodies to address, but also the other system-wide spending. Um, so that but I'm just referring to a meeting about regarding the final plan. Yeah, well, we, we acknowledge that um, we probably should have had that meeting. We thought we heard a lot from the public, but Again, we admitted um, just previously that we probably should have that input before we submit a final plan to the DEC so that the public is not surprised by what alternative the DEP selected and we pledge going forward that we will um, insert that step in the process. But the plan is a fait accompli, right? There's no ability to shape it going forward now that you have approval. Correct. Okay. Uh, I, I, that was depressing. Um, I, I have a question about water rates and I wanna build on some of the questions that Councilmember Richards asked. Um, have you given thought to restructuring water and water waste, wastewater bill to factor in the amount of, of stormwater runoff a property might contribute to the city's water system? 
We are looking at that. Okay. Um, we are proposing to study that in great detail. I myself, uh, as a part of a team, conducted a um, rate alternative rate study analysis um, probably a decade ago. But it is absolutely time for us to do another review of a holistic. It wouldn't just be related to stormwater rates. Uh, I think what our utility needs is a more thorough uh, evaluation of alternative rate structures that have been used elsewhere to see whether or not there is an improved structure out there for the city of New York. Having said that, we have not found one yet, but we really do want to uh, reevaluate this and take a very careful, cautious look at that um, because this is a zero sum game, right? We have to raise the rates every year or the revenues um, to be able to pay into the uh, debt and to make new investments that we all want to see. However, we need to do that very carefully and um, really study very, um, as I said, cautiously, what impacts that would have on our rate payers. And having said that, a lot of the- And when will, are you in the process of conducting a study? Or I'm will? in the process of putting together um, a, an RFP. I don't want to say too much more about okay. that. So that, that is- So you're not at liberty to, bid. to comment on the timeline? The timing for an RFP is about two years. Okay. So in two years, we'll, and what, we'll have the, the end of the conclusion of the study or, in two or years the beginning of the study? In three years, we should have potentially the conclusion of a study. Okay, three years. Yeah. It is going to be a very comprehensive, holistic look at the alternative rate structures that are out there. Um, you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to presume to have an indication of what the answer will look like because I think the process will reveal to us what are the possible strategies and winning strategies and what are the uh, strategies that won't work for our jurisdiction. Yeah, because look, I'm concerned about the problem of free riding, right? There were owners of larger impervious surfaces who are enjoying the benefits of the city's uh, stormwater management system without paying their fair share and it would seem to me, unless we have a separate fee for stormwater, we're undermining our own strategic goal of incentivizing, incentivizing green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? If you're able to free ride, there's no incentive for you to actually invest in green infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that I, I think we, we should just quit perpetuating the inequities that are built into the structure of our water rate. But I suspect you agree philosophically. It's just a matter of getting it done. So. So with that said, I, I think that's the extent of my question. So. Thank you, Council Member I'm gonna to go to Council Member Levin. I also wanted to raise a question on uh, Alley Creek and Flushing Creek. So for around a decade, uh, we've recognized that both could use more storage. Uh, has there been any thought process in adding a second storage tank anywhere? At both locations? So again, that's where we were um, referring to before, where we start to look at uh, what we are proposing under the recommended plan, which is an additional $45.8 million of investment in Flushing Creek, for example, versus a uh, 130 million gallon tunnel there, which would be about um, $5 billion. So, so the answer is yes. Are you open to adding? We do not believe that that is a cost-effective project that could be done simultaneously with the other investments that we're making because that would mean that the additional $4.5 billion that we're proposing would balloon to um, 9.5. It would balloon to 9.5. Um, Jamaica Bay Plan, where are we at with that? We can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> we are in the throes of um, doing our QAQC on our data collection, and we are preparing that long-term control plan. Do we have a date for a public meeting? We're thinking somewhere in the March, April? Yes, March or April. We've had two public meetings in Jamaica Bay so far. Um, one was the kickoff, and the second was an update to explain why we asked for an extension and explain all of the other work that's happening in the Jamaica Bay watershed. And before we submit 
the Jamaica Bay plan, do we anticipate coming back to the public and doing it differently? That's correct. Okay, so the public will get to see, you've heard that, mm -hmm. get to see the plan before it's submitted to DEC. That's right, so we do plan to share the selected alternative with the public before it is submitted to the state. So we're charting a new course is what I'm hearing. It is a new course and something that we've been in conversation with the state on um, in response to the community feedback that we've received over the years. And I just wanna hop back over to the stormwater fee because uh, I know that uh, you know, approximately 70% of all New York City properties are one to four family homes. And I do have a concern that communities of color may be more adversely affected by this. So can you speak to how we're really going to ensure that uh, there's equity around the system? That, that is precisely the problem. We need to really look at who is generating the runoff in addition to um, single family homes and how those costs could be reallocated. So there are many strategies for consideration. Um, we have not applied those strategies to New York City um, ratepayers or building classes yet, but we have studied each and every, we can almost say, of the best practices that are being applied across the country. And I will say also that I'm very glad that we have not charted the, the path forward on this. Mm. There are a lot of municipalities that made a lot of mistakes. So I think that we're in a position to benefit from some that potentially did not get this right and to really look at what um, are the best strategies out there and, and, and learn. So um, we will have to be very careful of your point, which is that we do have over 70% single family occupants. And then uh, have we also thought about, I'm gonna go to Council Member Levin uh, right after this, incentivizing uh, homeowners or individuals to install green infrastructure. So has there been any thought to that? That can be you know, a strategic way of ensuring that we are addressing the issue and people are taking ownership of the issue. So has there, been any thought process and perhaps reducing, you know, your water bill or, or rate a little bit uh, right. as an incentive if you install green infrastructure? Right. So, I mean, one of the things that we've been doing for a very long time is water conservation, and that's gone a really long way to the water, addressing the rain barrels and that's the rain barrels and toilet replacement programs. And just generally speaking, we've been very fortunate about um, new construction resulting in tighter plumbing fixtures and reducing the potable water, which reduces the amount of that that is discharged into the sewer system during rain events, leaving additional storage or um, capacity for rainwater. In addition to that, we do have our green infrastructure grant program that has not been as well subscribed as we had hoped. Uh, frankly, I, I'm disappointed that we're, we leave money on the table. We try to advertise that. Uh, we have $15 million out there in grants, but we would like to see that grow. In addition to that, we are um, looking at a private incentive program that would take uh, advantage of some of the applications that we've seen in other cities. And I don't wanna say again too much about that when we're going out with the RFP. I don't wanna give too many details, but I will say that it And that's in the same time frame as the other? Yes, or, okay. so we're working on both of those simultaneously. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go to Council Member Levin for questions. We also were joined by Council Member Ulrich, who I think will be back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to the panel. Um, I just have a few questions, um, uh, specifically starting with uh, Newtown Creek. Um, so uh, with DEP's objective of reducing um, um, stormwater runoff uh, in Newtown Creek, um, is DEP diverting uh, uh, sewage into other waterways, specifically the East River? We refer to it as displacing, and I will let Jim Muller, who understands that really well, and I'm not trying to be cute, I'm just saying that that, that is in That's fact the technical what thing. is happening, is, it is it, we are displacing flow. But let us explain to you why that occurs and how we are trying to effectively bring the um, stormwater as quickly as possible to our treatment facilities. If you don't mind, Jim. 
So as Deputy Commissioner Licata referred to before, for Newtown Creek, there's two projects in, in her testimony. She referred to it. One is the Borden Avenue pumping station upgrade. Uh, we're going to upgrade that pumping station to 25 million gallons per day during wet weather. It's going to get pumped over to Newtown Creek directly to the plant, uh, about a half a mile force main or three quarters of a mile of a force main that will run uh, to the plant. When that flow goes to the plant, it will be treated at the plant because it's going directly there. Mm -hmm. So when you say relocation, that's, we're not relocating the flow. It's actually going to get treatment. What it does is displaces flow from the East River where those, over, those um, CSOs would, would normally go to the plant. It'll displace some fraction of those CSOs, and there'll be additional flow to the East River. I think it's at two or three uh, locations. Uh, the majority of it goes out. Um, it's a small percentage of the overall flow that currently goes out, so it's not like we're doubling the flow to the East River, uh, but there is a fraction uh, increase at certain outfalls at the East River. One thing we're going to do is look at those outfalls, particularly during the citywide long-term control plan that's due at the end of 2018, and see what we can do, whether it's a regulator improvement program to capture more of that flow, or some other local, um, whether it's GI or some other local solutions to maybe offset that fraction, fractional increase. The other project in Newtown is the big CSO storage tunnel for the three large outfalls in the back part of the creek. Mm -hmm. That's a longer term project. The Borden Avenue pumping station is in about a 10 to 12 year time frame. The tunnel is in about a 22 to 25 year time frame because it's, it's two orders of magnitude larger. It's a billion, $1.4 billion for that tunnel. So it's a very large tunnel. Siding's, of course, an issue. And then just the running it to the treatment plant and, and pumping it out for treatment there. All of that is a, a very uh, complex project. So it's a longer term project. In the shorter term for Dutch Kills, which is near the community college, uh, I know it's a, 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 a kayaking. I actually kayaked up there uh, two years ago with the uh, Newtown Creek Alliance. Um, uh, so it's a, an accessible water body. So that's where we're starting is the investments there. But it will result in a displacement of a fraction of the flow toward East River. And that's something we're going to look at in the citywide in terms of mitigating. And the, the tunnel would would eliminate that long term because the tunnel will be able to to, to uh, divert that all back into the into the wastewater treatment facility. So the tunnel, there's four major outfalls into Newtown Creek. Mm -hmm. The Borden Avenue pumping station is on one of those major outfalls, which is in Dutch Kills near LaGuardia Community College. Mm -hmm. The other three outfalls are in are, are further into the creek. Uh, so the tunnel will really address those other three, mm -hmm. where about a billion gallons of flow goes, goes out in those three right now. The tunnel's really aimed at mitigating that. The other outfall uh, in Dutch Kills is much smaller. It's about 100 million gallons a year as opposed to a billion, so it's about 10 percent of the overall flow. Mm -hmm. So Borden Avenue will get us about a 75 percent reduction, which is very high level of reduction. That's the project we have planned for Borden. It would, it, there's no future, uh, no future project planned for Borden at this point. How many gallons are displaced then into the East River? I'm sorry? How many gallons are displaced into the East River then? I can get you that information. I don't have it at my fingertips, but it's certainly something we, we have calculated and have an estimate on. I do not have it at my fingertips right now. But There's no way to that. eliminate that without, be, you know, outside of these long-term capital improvements. Well, one thing we're going to look at in the citywide is locally where we are discharging in the East River. Is there a regulator improvement program or some other infrastructure improvement we can make to mitigate that? Or green you know, a combination of green and gray, similar to what we've done in other areas, that, mm -hmm. can, that can potentially mitigate that. Okay. Um, how are you in terms of um, bioswales and other green infrastructure in the communities around Newtown Creek. I know, for example, there was a large scale, you know, one of the um, GSEF uh, projects, which was around bioswales in the northern part of Greenpoint, um, actually just got rescinded. There was some complications with the OT, and out of 100 or so that were originally supposed to be cited, uh, you know, only, you know, a small percentage were, were able to clear the other regulatory hurdles and the project ended up being rescinded and, and reallocated to another project that might not may or may not be a green infrastructure project but um, it was obviously disappointing um, and uh, that was that was you know the GCEF is the for those that don't know is this is a is a, a fund created by the Exxon Mobil uh, settlement with the state attorney general and so you know that was that was um, uh, resources that you know were not part of DEP funds; those were those were you know those were from an alternative source, and so obviously it was disappointing to see that that project was abandoned if that was going to um, uh, divert wastewater into the Newtown Creek. 
Well, I mean, good news with respect to Newtown Creek is it is one of our priority areas, um, and it is an area where we have been designing and constructing already, and what we are doing there is going um, through a rain garden program, street to street, looking for opportunities to saturate um, the roadways or streets, if you will, um, with rain gardens. So we look for every opportunity there. We also have the opportunity currently through some contracts to look at the uh, parklands that are within those tributaries, the schools, and NYCHA developments. And we have several projects that are currently in design, and I can give you the numbers and names of all of those projects. Um, so we have been looking uh, very routinely at almost every opportunity within those watersheds for green infrastructure investments um, with the hope of saturating that area. We also um, have increased potentially, I guess is a way to put that, our risk tolerance. So, so in the beginning of the program, we eliminated some sites as a result of um, infiltration techniques, but now that we have been able to collect, um, you know, through research and development, uh, some performance data, we're feeling uh, somewhat confident about going back and potentially looking uh, once again at some of the sites that we rejected. So there's another opportunity for us to circle back around the block, if you will, and um, take another look at those opportunities. Can I ask you if you could do that with reaching out to, it was, you know, through NIFWIF, uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and um, uh, the other organizations that are managing that project. I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, the overall GCEF project was like $20 million, um, but this was one that was going to have a direct impact, and again, it was literally just in the last couple of months, I uh, came back and said that you know, the practical application for this was about, I think it was about 100 bioswales in Northern Greenpoint that were um, now diverted to other projects. Disappointing. Yeah, that, that is disappointing. I'm not uh, familiar with the circumstances. I will um, contact Lynn Dwyer or uh, NIFWIF and uh, try to determine whether or not our program is applicable to that area, only because some of the area in and around Newtown Creek is um, direct discharge or part of the separate sewer system. Mm -hmm. so the current program that we have budgeted is related to the combined sewer system. So I will take a look at the particulars there yeah. and see what um, we can do and why they abandoned some of those sites. Okay. I'm pretty sure they're in the combined sewer area. It wasn't okay. In this, um, That'll be great. Okay. Um, so another question around um, that area of, of Greenpoint, uh, an area that I represent, but then also applies to other parts of the district that I represent, is you know the, the tremendous amount of development that's happening at a very fast rate. These were um, development that's pursuant to old rezonings. So in downtown Brooklyn, the rezoning was in 2004, but a lot of the buildings have been coming up in the last couple of years because of the real estate cycle. Same is the case in um, Williamsburg Greenpoint along the waterfront. Uh, where the rezoning was in 2005, um, but if you you know if you look out there now, you know if you look out from Newtown Creek now, you'll see um, uh, two buildings that have gone up on the Greenpoint waterfront. There's probably going to be about um, 30 more in the next 15 years, and uh, and so you know the the amount of um, taxation on that uh, neighborhoods infrastructure uh, is going to be pretty dramatic. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, it's hard to fathom it, but if you go out there and you look, you see, you'll see two buildings that have gone up in the last year, you know, multiply that by 15. Um, so is, are, the, are all of these upgrades keeping a pace with what you anticipate the development? I mean, and are you talking to Department of City Planning and, and making sure that they're telling you exactly what level of population is going to be there, um, you know, what type of, uh, what type of physical um, imprint all that development is going to uh, look like, and then and so that you can make sure that your long-term capital um, improvements are, um, uh, you know, looking towards accommodating that level of development, particularly in Greenpoint, but then also in downtown Brooklyn and, 
and, uh, and uh, you know, other areas? The short answer is yes. Um, the Certainly the long-term control plans have factored in those uh, rezonings and projected those flows and loads, as we call them. Mm -hmm. um, so the volume and the uh, constituents or the characteristics of the effluent into account um, and projected to 2040. Okay. Um, and there's a kind of constant communication with, with DCP. I mean, there, you know, because on top of that, you know, then I'm also having uh, developers or owners of property coming back for additional rezonings on top of the 2005 rezoning. So, you know, uh, Domino got rezoned, then they came back, they wanted more zoning. I got other projects that want more zoning. So they got like, you know, so now they want to add a million square feet of commercial on top of their million, two million square feet of residential. You know, so it's not just the 2005 rezoning, it's now they want more than what they had even, even back then. And so it's, you know, it's piecemeal, but it's, it's cumulative. Right, and we do have um, close coordination with city planning, but that is challenging when we're hitting, a, or trying to hit a moving target like that, um, but we do have the luxury of a period of time where we will be designing our facilities, and so there will be an opportunity to take another look back, um, or I should say look ahead, mm -hmm. at uh, what the future zoning densities will be. Okay, um, so it'd be good to make sure that, you know, at least you know what, what they know. So, mm -hmm. you know, if yes. you know, they're working with somebody on an, an additional application over a four-year, you know, the kind of lead-in time, mm -hmm. it'd be good to know. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, I wanted to ask about, um, it, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know that much about water rates, but are you looking at being uh, a way to calculate uh, stormwater runoff of a particular property into that property's uh, water rate calculation? Yeah, so what we were discussing earlier is that we w would like to embark on a holistic integrated um, water rate structure or look at um, alternative structures that would help the city um, from several perspectives uh, more equitably charge for stormwater services, um, represent an, uh, our fixed costs from year to year and provide us with a sustainable um, revenue stream going into the future, assuming even more water conservation. So, um, you know, the old way of doing business is you're basically billed on your consumption level. Mm -hmm. um, and that's frustrating for people because they conserve and then we charge um, more money because we have other things that we're paying for. So it, it is a, uh, program that we want to take a look at, and, and I call it a program because it will require a lot of disciplines. It will require um, specific data analytics um, and GIS systems to allow us to look at the properties um, and the individual characteristics of properties and, mm -hmm. and group properties and figure out the most um, protective way of billing um, for everybody's interests. And the reason, I mean, I didn't say earlier, but I'll say now that we are at this point in, uh, you know, the programming, we haven't looked at it yet, we're looking at it now, is because we have a new billing system that we're also putting into place. Our older um, billing system would not have the capacity to do these new rate structures. So as we move forward and invest in that new billing system, we are leaving and holding open the possibility that some of these other rate structures could be adopted. Okay, I'd like obviously want to encourage that, and you know, I, there's we want to make sure that we're encouraging conservation and um, and discouraging um, you know uh, owners from having essentially you know hardscape blacktop property that uh, does makes no zero effort um, you know to uh, to mitigate any any stormwater runoff. Um, which, you know, is happening in large parts of my district for sure. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, um, before we let you go, get to the to get to the public, also I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilmember Perkins. Uh, is there a publicly accessible website where people can see where the green infrastructure projects are actually happening and, and where you're making progress at? 
uh, with the mat? Yes. Um, we have, if you go to nyc.gov slash mm -hmm. rain gardens, there is a map that you can access. Okay. You can plug in your, act your address and see um, planned, designed, and constructed green infrastructure assets near your home. Um, you can also add layers like your city council district or mm -hmm. community board district or neighborhood to get a sense of the scale of the green infrastructure program. For those that are interested in the long-term control plans, all of the presentations that we've given to the public are available online, as well as our responses to comments received by the public um, about the particular plans. And in some cases, we also have videos of our meetings. So if you weren't able to attend, you can watch that um, and hear some of the back and forth. Okay, and, and also the proposed projects as well. That's correct. Okay. Um, we've also, and I believe that all of the um, council members have received one of our new long-term control plan, plan brochures, which goes into all of the project details, costs, benefits, and so on. Um, and on our website, we also have water body specific fact sheets okay. that talk about earlier investments and proposed. All right, well, I wanna thank you uh, for the work that you're doing. We still have a long way to go to ensuring our waterways are fishable, swimmable, boatable. Uh, and drinkable, <laughs> if you want to drink it too. Um, uh, but uh, we appreciate the work you're doing and look forward to continuing uh, to work with you to make sure that we achieve uh, all of the latter. So thank you for uh, your testimony today. All righty, we're gonna get to the public now. I know we have some students from PS15K. Um, Angelina Sanchez, Sean Lee, Ronan Batiste, the future. Kayla Delgado, Ermin El Sagbi, Debbie Lee Cohen. Uh, all right, you're gonna uh, press your button. Hello, Acting Chair Richards, committee members and staff. My name is Ronan Battis. Sharon Lee. Kayla Delgado. Angelina Sanchez. And we are from PS15 Patrick F. Daly School in Red Hook, Brooklyn, representing the fifth grade. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. We have been learning about plastic street litter that becomes dangerous marine pollution and how it gets there. We collected street litter and data from our streets in Red Hook and from a beach at a Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. And guess what? We found the same types of litter in both places. In just one street litter survey in only one block in our neighborhood, we found 389 pieces of litter that will never biodegrade. Imagine how many pieces of litter there are in all of New York City. We learned with cafeteria culture that when it rains as little as one-tenth of an inch per hour, New York City's combined sewer, sewer system's capacity is overwhelmed, and the mix of polluted stormwater from our streets and untreated raw sewage from our toilets, sinks, and showers is going directly into our waterways. That means when it rains, everything, street litter and things we flush down the toilet, goes out to the ocean. We know that plastic litter shouldn't be in the ocean. Our fish and marine life think that plastic litter is food and they eat it, especially because all the plastic litter gets smaller and smaller and never biodegrades. It just keeps polluting our precious waterways and oceans. Imagine opening up a fish and finding plastic inside it, and then eating that fish. After we learned about how much litter we have in our neighborhood, we came up with lots of community actions to teach our neighbors about how plastic street litter affects marine life. We performed plays for our neighbors and gave away reusable bags that we made from t-shirts. We made charts and graphs from our litter data to ask the Department of Sanitation for recycling bins on the street. And we made banners like this one to hang on the fence 
to tell our neighbors the story of what happens to our street litter. And guess what? It worked. We know because we compared the data in our last street litter survey, the litter was reduced by two-thirds. First, we want to thank New York City for all that they have done already to improve the city's wastewater management system. But this is not enough. We really want the city to continue to improve the combined sewer overflow system. For example, you can let the water go somewhere to wait until after the rain stops, and then it could go to the wastewater treatment plant like normal. Or the storm drains on the street could be better designed, make the bars smaller and block the litter from going in. And why not paint a message right on the drain of the curb? We would love to have permission to make storm drain art in our neighborhood in Red Hook. Why can't we? Cities all over the U.S. have done this. These are from Maryland. Keep going. <laughs> I hope DEP is listening. And why, not, and why not paint a message right on the drain or curb? Cities all over the United States have done this. At least you can make a system to capture the litter near the outfall pipes, like Mi Mr. Trash Wheel in Baltimore. We are students, and we know that the health of our oceans affects the health of all of us. We also know that good data drives policy. We hope that our, number, our numbers and our experience teaches you what it taught us, that we need to do, reduce the amount of plastic litter going into our waters now. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to ask one question or two. Uh, and I also want to recommend that DEP hires uh, some of these individuals because they actually know what they're doing. I think they're the key to ensuring that uh, we correct this issue. Should we impose a five cent bag fee, plastic bag fee, in New York City? Or should we ban plastic bags? I just wanted to hear anyone's recommendation. Hope the state is listening today. Yeah. Angelina? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to hear her recommendation. What do you think? What do you think? We heard a lot about plastic in the ocean and our waterways. Five cents or bags? What did you tell people when you gave away the bags? The reusable bags. Don't be shy. Okay. Okay. You know you said no. You said ban them. Remember? You're an expert, so we want to hear that. Go ahead. Don't be shy. We don't bite. <laughs> yeah, Kilo's there. Let's do it. You gave away a reusable bag. Yeah, she did. What's the importance of reusable bags? Reusable bags are important because then you could reuse them and they won't go in our oceans and they could like fly out garbage cans and go in the sewers. Okay. If, we, if we have the five cent bag fee, then people wouldn't want to use um, plastic bags anymore. They would have their own reusable bags and, and um, the plastic bags wouldn't go into the ocean. So maybe, like, I think that's a better idea. Great. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out and your work uh, and uh, ensuring that we're educated and that the public is educated. And I would love to, I know the chair is not here, but we would love to see your recommendations in writing so that we can incorporate it in our conversations with DEP as well. And maybe DEP should hold a hearing with you all as well. Uh, that's a good recommendation. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for coming out and exercising democracy. Thank you. All righty, we're going to have our next panel. Uh, the Billion Oyster Project in New York Harbor School, Bliss Borrago, Liam Daratanli. Oh, who didn't get to testify? Oh, okay, you stay. I'm sorry. All right, we're um, going to call another panel. Hold on. Um, Mahambi Torre. Right. So they can come up. Billion Oyster Project, are you here? All right, so you all come up as well. And we're going to give each person three minutes on the clock. And just so you know, that those students uh, were part of a program that was funded by USA EPA Region 2, and oh, DEP awesome. was a partner in the project, and we're finishing our final report. So we'll share it with you. There's uh, lots of information forward, there from three neighborhoods in the city. That is so awesome. Thank you. And if you don't mind ensuring that that uh, is also presented to every council member, great. that would be great as great. well. Great. I'd love to do that. Okay. Thank you. Can you please raise your right hands? Do you swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Yes. I, yes. I do. 
Brady, you may begin. Okay, I'm Debbie Lee Cohen, Executive Director and Founder of Cafeteria Culture. We were founded as Styrofoam Out of Schools. We worked with uh, Department of Ed school food directors to eliminate polystyrene trays completely in all New York City schools. And we work to achieve zero waste schools, climate smart communities, and plastic free uh, initiatives and solutions with students as our partners. Um, we are particularly focused on student leadership roles to reduce local plastic street litter that becomes deadly global marine pollution. I'm grateful to present the concerns about our city's contribution to pervasive global marine plastic pollution crises and to share recommendations for reducing the unacceptable amounts of plastic litter that flow into our local waterways on a daily basis. Marine plastic debris is one of the greatest global and uh, health and environmental challenges of our time. As you probably know, there are more than 8 million tons of plastics entering our waterways every year. 80% of the ocean plastics are land-based. They're coming originally from land. And New York uh, holds responsibility for contributing to that. Um, by 2015, in a business-as-usual scenario, there'll be more plastic than fish by weight. We don't want to get there. Um, plastic breaks down easily. It turns into microplastics, which act like sponges, and they absorb toxic chemicals like PCBs and flame retardants. So when fish are eating these microplastics and then we're eating these fish, we are in fact eating these microplastics that are laden with toxins. It's estimated in New York City um, from a report by New York, New Jersey Baykeepers that 165 million plastic particles are floating in New York waterways at any time, although we do believe that's a low estimate. Some of the suggestions that we'd like to make are providing funding for urgently needed collaborative research on local plastic marine pollution to determine the sources, amounts, and specific types of plastic debris and waterways. This will shed light on the magnitude of the problem in our local area and inform policymakers with more data uh, for passing legislation to reduce plastics from entering our waterways. We also suggest increasing funding for innovating public outreach. As you can see what our kids did in our program, we got tremendously positive feedback from neighbors who maybe wouldn't have looked at a government sign, but seeing kids creative signage, and we also have uh, YouTube videos, people are much more um, likely to be engaged by locals actually talking about the issue. Um, we also suggest increasing and diversifying green infrastructure. I know that that's going on, but I know there's not enough of it. And in particularly partnering with Department of Ed, with our school custodial staff, as well as with school construction authority. There are often a lot of challenges to make green infrastructure happen. A mandate on environmental literacy. We, this is something that would save the city millions and millions of dollars. We spend so much money, billions in sanitation and Department of Environmental Protection and so little in education. It's time that we really focus on that and also to reduce microfibers, which is one of the newest issues that we're aware about now and to begin a discussion with DEP, local communities and outreach simply on how to reduce microfibers. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you for your testimony and work. Thank you for hearing, hearing me today. My name is Liam Deratani, and I am a junior at the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. And I'm here on the behalf of my fellow divers and the entire student body, as well as young people across the city. The Harbor School is a public high school located on Governor's Island in the heart of New York Harbor. The school instills a sense of environmentalism in its students that we take with us beyond our high school careers. I grew up only a few blocks away from Midland Beach on Staten Island, and as far back as I, rem I remember, I've always been told to never go in the water. You'll grow an extra arm. And I thought this was a joke until I got to the Harbor School. At my school, I participate in a unique three-year professional diving program, which allows me to graduate with many certifications on top of my high school diploma and prepares me for a career working in our harbor as well as for college. With combined sewage overflow systems still operating in the city, this makes my life as a diver more difficult than it should be. We need to wait 72 hours after it rains, as little as a quarter of an inch, to avoid contact with things like fecal coliform and prescription drugs. New York Harbor was once a stunning habitat that was home to an inconceivable amount of biodiversity, but now you can hardly see your hand two feet in front of your face. We are a city that has forgotten its roots. The harbor that allowed us safe passes and access to shipping we have used as a personal dumping ground. The oysters that built our economy are now killed off by overpollution. The fish we once thrived off of are now too toxic to even think of eating. We can change this. We could go back to once we once had, and the first steps would be to find an alternative solution to combine sewage overflow systems in New York Harbor. Programs such as the Billion Oyster Project can then more effectively continue their work to restore and thus maintain the environment 
and students such as myself can access the water without worry. Thank you for hearing me out today. I hope you'll take my testimony and the testimony of others who speak today into consideration. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mohamed Torre. I'm a current senior at the New York Harbor School Professional Diving Program. The dumping of CSOs has cost my classmates and I many days of diving throughout my three years at the New York Harbor School. Being a diver, I've learned to deal, but looking back on all the dives I have missed out on, I wonder how much better of a diver I would be now if I'd been able to dive all those days I missed due to combined sewage outflows. We cancel dives based on rainfall data and an assumption that there will be a CSO event. We get NY alert notifications, but it's not real-time accurate information. We request transparency anytime there is a CSO event. I'd like to read a short statement, a short statement from one of our diving teachers, Lenny Sparrigan. I was a commercial diver in New York Harbor for a large portion of my diving career, and I have seen an amazing change in our harbor since the Clean Water Act. However, every time it rains and the DEP feels the rainfall will exceed more than a quarter of an inch of rain, there is a discharge of untreated sewage and oil and gasoline-filled street runoff. As a professional diver, it was my job to dive regardless of the water condition. Now that I'm a teacher at the New York Harbor School, my students are the ones impacted by this discharge. I cannot train them in the harbor in these conditions. It negatively impacts their training and ultimately their safety and health. It is well past time to upgrade our untreated sewage storage systems. Responsible people do not treat their environment this way. Today affects my students, tomorrow everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good morning, my name is Bliss Petrago and I am testifying on behalf of the Billion Oyster Project. New York Harbor was once a robust estuary, teeming with over 220,000 acres of oysters. Thanks to measures such as the Clean Water Act, the Billion Oyster Project has been working in partnership with the New York Harbor School to restore our native oysters to New York City waterways. For the first time in centuries, the oysters are surviving and building the foundation for future populations. Our oysters, despite their size, contribute towards improved water quality, build habitat for many other of our marine critters, help protect our shoreline from major storm surges like Superstorm Sandy, and many other contributions. Through Billion Oyster Project alone, 25 million oysters have been restored to New York Harbor and reefs are taking hold. The thousands of students we work with are passionate about the harbor they're creating and the harbor they want to see protected. As hundreds of our college students, teachers, environmental educators, academic institutions, restaurants, and other organizations across the city are working tirelessly alongside our team to restore and steward our natural environment. Our dedicated constituents have worked to improve their local waters, but every raw sewage overflow reverses that progress. In particular, the communities of Coney Island Creek, Flushing Bay and Creek, Newtown Creek, and Bronx River are burdened by an extreme volume of sewage overflows that impacts their quality of life and health of their families. Despite this public health challenge, each of these communities tirelessly advocate for their local waterfront to create a healthy ecosystem with abundant access for community goers to enjoy. Though, through our educational programs, many individuals and youth have the opportunity to view their waterfront for the very first time. Witnessing that moment of pure curiosity and joy fuels the need for our work to ensure every New Yorker has this type of opportunity. We have a unique moment to further progress towards a swimmable and fishable New York Harbor for future generations to enjoy. The Billion Oyster Project and our constituents will continue to work towards this New York Harbor that we envision, and we hope that you will help us by reducing CSOs and eliminating chlorination of raw sewage as a mitigation strategy. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for your testimony. I want to thank you for the work your organization is doing in the Rockaways as well. Uh, we're very appreciative of it, and I thank you for your testimony today. All right, we're going to go to the next panel. Carter Strickland, Trust for the Public Land, Jamie Stein, Swim Coalition, Lawrence Levine, Natural Resources Defense Council, Sean Dixon, Riverkeeper. You have everyone? Okay, so Carter Strickland, Trust for Public Land, Jamie Stein, Swim Coalition, Lawrence Levine, Natural Resources Defense Council, Sean Dixon, Riverkeeper.
still have 20 over here. Okay, I need four here. Ready, you raise your hand and Samara's gonna swear you in. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. 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 Alrighty, Carter Strickland, you know the you know the drill. Thank you. <laughs> good to see you. Excuse me. Thank you. There I go. Thank you, Acting Chairman Richards. It's good to see you again. And other members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on this important topic. My name is Carter Strickland. I'm the New York State Director of the Trust for Public Land a national nonprofit that works to create parks and protect land for people, ensuring healthy, livable communities. Uh, I have testimony that I'm going to summarize here, given the short timeline and so many people who are interested in this topic. We've been involved in New York City since 1978, um, working with communities and the government to improve New York City neighborhoods through land protection open space initiatives. In that time, we've seen the city dramatically transform from the depths of urban decay to the heights of revitalization in just 40 years. New York City has become a place that attracts and retains families, workers, tourists, rather than repels them. The harbor's gone through a similar transformation in that time period, as you've heard, uh, in part due to investments by, of billions of dollars by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, including the $1.5 billion commitment to green infrastructure plan. It's already bearing fruit. Um, transforming the very landscape of the city with 4,000 rain gardens built already. Uh, it's not easy to do things in New York City, and I think that re represents a tremendous uh, accomplishment. Um, we've been involved in reimagining the waterfront lands um, and also in working with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection on transforming cities through a very innovative playgrounds program that I want to acknowledge and describe a little bit for your consideration. Um, what we do on the land does definitely affects runoff and what, what ends up in the harbor. Uh, we consider that factor when we decide to build uh, playgrounds. We've built 194 playgrounds to date. Uh, this infrastructure provides new parkland within a 10 minute walk of three and a half million New Yorkers and has transformed 150 acres of barren asphalt school lots into green infrastructure. I provided a few pictures of before and after which is pretty remarkable in the testimony. Uh, these playgrounds are a cost effective way to mitigate potential stormwater damage by collecting millions of gallons of runoff that would otherwise flood streets, overwhelm sewers, and pollute local waterways. Uh, we do work with kids and actually to educate them. I'm happy to see that you allow the kids to testify first. They are our future, and I think through educating them with not only our sewer in the suitcase uh, proposal, but also uh, uh, educational program, but also, thanks to many people, uh, but also in getting kids involved in designing green infrastructure. These are our future landscape architects and we're helping to educate them. Um, every one of our playgrounds is designed by kids. Since 2013, DEP has helped fund 11 of our green infrastructure playgrounds, each of which absorb an average annual of 650,000 gallons of rainwater. One, for example, at G uh, Junior High School 185 in Queens will capture 1.1 million gallons annually. Collectively, our green infrastructure playgrounds built with DEP collect nearly 6.4 million gallons of rainwater annually. We have four more in the pipeline, two in Queens, one in Brooklyn, one in Manhattan. These four will capture an additional three million gallons of stormwater. It's a program that works, uh, and we think it um, bears further investment. I will say on water rates, there's a very good example of rates working in conjunction with water efficiency programs on the water side. DP's water use peaked in the early 80s at about 1.6 billion gallons a day. It's not about a billion gallons a day. Due to a number of factors, metering happening in the early 90s and also rate increases. Price signals work in conjunction with these projects. Worked on the water side. There's no reason it can't work on the wastewater side. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Jamie Stein, and I am the Stormwater Infrastructure Matters Coalition Steering Committee Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to offer the following comments on behalf of SWIN. We thank the Committee on Environmental Protection for your oversight of the city's water quality improvement plans. SWIM is a diverse group of more than 70 community-based, citywide, regional, and national organizations, citizens, and businesses, all advocating for the health of New York City's vital waterways since 2007. We recognize the effort which DEP has put into the existing plans. However, we still have a long way to go in order to meet the fishable, swimmable, federal health standards mandated for New York City waterways. 
The approved and submitted plans, many submitted without final public review, will leave hundreds of millions of gallons of sewage overflows in each water body annually on dozens of occasions per year. Many of the plans do not reduce overflow volume at all and instead call for diverting raw sewage into the East River or dumping chlorine into raw sewage before discharging it to rivers, creeks, and bays. In brief, our testimony offers the following essential actions for effective water quality planning. Number one, effective CSO long-term control plans with expedited timelines, rejection of chlorination, reduction of overflow volume rather than redirection, and alignment of plans for combined sewer and separate storm sewer areas. Number two, a robust and adaptively managed green infrastructure plan with a comprehensive contingency plan to meet missed milestones, improved interagency collaboration for green infrastructure on municipal property, diverse green infrastructure methods beyond biosoils, more green infrastructure on private property, and expansion of green infrastructure into the MS4 area. Number three, equitable financing and water rates with a more equitable rate structure and directing DEP to conduct a rate restructuring study. Number four, water quality standards that actually protect public health. And lastly, a transparent and inclusive decision-making process which provides genuine opportunities for public input and accountability for city and state to address public concerns during the development, approval, and implementation of long-term control plans. SWIM Coalition has distributed fact sheets outlining communities' concerns with each of the city's proposed long-term control plans and shared our principles for clean waterways with all the city council members and many elected officials citywide to alert them about the flawed plans in their districts. We have shared the principles as a guide for how the city and state can improve on the plans that are meant to protect our waters. We thank the council for holding this public hearing and providing the opportunity for waterway stakeholders from around the city to be heard. We look forward to a healthy public discourse on the concerns raised here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, my name is Lawrence Levine. I'm a senior attorney with Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, I just want to take two seconds to say, wow, the students were amazing. Uh, they made my day. <laughs> uh, I've got lengthy testimony as well that I'm only going to summarize really briefly. Um, I, I did want to, even before that, respond to two points that came up earlier with uh, DEP's testimony um, and, and some earlier statements that were made. One is just to emphasize that it's not only when there's a heavy rainfall, and it's not just occasional that we get these overflows. It's, but some, that's often something that's said it's a tenth of an inch of rain can trigger it, and there have been a hundred times this year already that DEP has reported an overflow to the state and that I got that email from the state saying there's been an overflow somewhere in the city. That's very typical. It's not just this year, and it's not just the small storms. Um, second thing is there was a question uh, for DEP about whether these approved plans are a fait accompli, right? As far as the state is concerned, yeah, they seem to be. As far as the city of New York is concerned, if the mayor of the city of New York decides he wants to do something more and better, He's completely empowered to do that. Uh, if if the city council, if the city council, uh, if the city council chooses to use authorities, it has to push DEP and the mayor to do more. More can be done, and that's that's why we're all here today. Um, I, I'm on the steering committee of the Swim Coalition, fully endorse all of the points in Jamie's testimony, and I wanted to uh, emphasize a couple of points uh, in mind. Um, one is about revamping the city's efforts to stimulate green infrastructure on private property. Uh, I'd like to refer you to a, a detailed report that NRDC put out over the summer uh, with extensive recommendations based on interviews with hundreds of stakeholders with uh, working closely at DEP with someone sitting in their office uh, for about a year, uh, a series of recommendations to create what we think can be a terrific grant program, scalable, um, with working with community-based uh, organizations to implement it. Regulations for private development are also essential for getting green infrastructure on private property, and we think that that's one place where DEP has, uh, has really fallen down uh, on the job, uh, and there's, there are best practices that are out there that work in other cities that DEP has not picked up on. Uh, and then, secondly, rate structure. There's been a lot of discussion about it, and that's terrific. 
Um, it's critical to reform DEP's rate structure to equitably generate the funds that we need for clean water investments. DEP emphasizes affordability challenges and costs. There are, it's a key assumption embedded in all of that, which is that the rate structure stays the same. When DEP projects what the costs would be, in particular to low income uh, customers, it's based on the current rate structure projecting future spending. If we improve that rate structure, and there are many ways we can do it, and a stormwater fee is actually one of them that would help on this equity issue, we can raise more revenue, invest more, without imposing undue burdens on low-income customers. And that's why this, this rate restructuring issue is so critical uh, to this whole discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here to testify. My name is Sean Dixon. I'm a senior attorney with Riverkeeper and also on the steering committee of the Swim Coalition. Um, Larry took my point about the city going above and beyond and my statement about the children. So I think that I'm going to bring in their teachers as well. And I think I want to thank the teachers for encouraging such brave and well-intentioned uh, and well-informed students. Um, beyond that, I want to address three key points that the city made, but after I think uh, one that, that is inside my testimony that I won't get to because we don't have that much time today, and that's to change the system that we use as a city to think about how we move forward. When we had problems with drinking water, we built one of the world's most uh, insanely impressive engineering feats to bring better clean drinking water to the city. When we had problems with open space, we brought in designers that put in places like Central Park and Prospect Park. When we had issues with a lot of our sewage problems, we ended up just sitting on this issue for decades and decades and decades. And so what we've been left with now is a system of pollution that is one of the last great unaddressed aspects of our city's infrastructure. If you want to build a new building today, you cannot build that building without looking at the impacts to the subway system near it, to the schools, how many seats are there for new children that you're going to be bringing in, to even questions uh, as mundane as how much additional traffic and pedestrian uh, intensity are you going to be bringing to a street corner. What we do not do is say in any given new building, any new project, what can you do to fix this centuries-old problem that is going to cost us $30 billion if we had it to spend. And so that's the point that I want to make on the, on the fees and how we pay for these issues, is it's not just on the DEP's shoulders to figure out how to raise $30 billion. It's on every new developer, every new renovation, every new design, and frankly, on every new street that we repave. Uh, every single one of our decisions across the city can be done better. Uh, and what we're not doing right now is making any new, better improved choices for our stormwater. Three things that I wanted to point out about the, the city's testimony is, first, on public participation. I've been to almost every LTCP public meeting that's been held by the city uh, for every one of the LTCPs, and I can tell you that some of them have had three people, some of them have had five, and some of them have had a hundred. And in all cases, the feedback from the communities largely went ignored in the final plans, and that's something that I've been very disappointed about. It seems that in some of the meetings where a hundred people stood up and said, we do not want chlorination in these waters, we want capture, the city's plan that came out on the backside of the process was to, ca was to chlorinate those waters and ignore that community's voice. So there's a difference between having an open hearing and listening to the community. Second, on, on the issue of what we're going to get from these plans, the city constantly said, if you listen to their testimony, that these plans 25 years from now, in the case of Newtown Creek and other waterways, would meet existing water quality standards. Those existing water quality standards, it's important to note, are currently the subject of a lawsuit uh, brought by Riverkeeper and others in this room challenging the state's reliance on 40-year-old technology or on, on technological water quality standards that the EPA itself in letters last year to the state of New York said were scientifically indefensible. So if we wait until the mid-2040s to assess whether or not we should have done something better today, when we know today what we should be using to gauge our success because it came out from the EPA in the 1980s and was again reassessed in, in 2012, then we're doing a great disservice to the community. Lastly, just one quick point on chlorination. I think one of the system's issues with this entire structure of the way the city's made its decisions uh, with respect to these has been backwards. When we have a suite of impacts that are going to come out of a system that we only address after we've decided to put in place that technology, then we are also doing a disservice to the community. We should be looking at all of the potential impacts to historic uh, districts, to community and public health, to transportation of all of the different types of gray infrastructure construction projects, and like in an EIS, 
figure out where exactly we can mitigate or avoid those impacts before we settle on an alternative choice. Here we've done it completely backwards. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I'm able to take any questions. Thank you. And uh, I think if I heard you correctly, you said we should incorporate uh, stormwater runoff uh, 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 projections and EISs. Absolutely. And right. this is something that I think we, we've raised before is that the city has the ability to say you can, you know, you have to look at noise impact even mm -hmm. uh, on construction sites. Why aren't we just taking that concept and applying it to stormwater? One of the things that I'm encouraged on, and I mentioned this in the testimony, is that the DEP told us in a meeting yesterday that they've been able to work with a pilot program with New York City Parks Department to take not just the stormwater that lands on that park. Uh, and keep it out of the system, but use that park, and I, I think it's in Queens, uh, use that park to absorb stormwater from the surrounding community. Mm -hmm. And that's in conjunction with DOT, with new innovations in mm -hmm, how to move mm -hmm. stormwater across streets. That kind of forward thinking is also needed here. So it's mm -hmm. not just where we can build the biggest tunnel or the biggest tank, but it's how we approach the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I get anybody's thoughts on chlorination? Um, sure. The, this discussion seems to come back to is it done elsewhere or not? Is it proven mm -hmm. elsewhere or not? And this is a really technical engineering question that we usually hear pretty high level generic answers to. The particulars of how it's done and what the context is in New York City of how it would be applied within our sewer system may differ significantly from the ways in which chlorination has been used in other mm -hmm. places. My understanding of the LTCPs that have chlorination is that the proposal is to put the chlorine directly into the sewer pipes, not to put it into a tank where the sewage has been temporarily captured and allowed to settle and the turbidity is able to be reduced. But you've got that sewage, filthy, cloudy, in the sewer pipe and attempting to chlorinate that and get the chlorine to hit what's in there that you want to kill. That may be a very different circumstance than the way that it's done in other places, and that's something we need to know if that's the case. Um, and the same goes on the dechlorination piece. Um, is dechlorination used in other places in a similar circumstance, and is it used effectively? And on dechlorination, I, just, I also just want to point out that the terms of the state's approval of the plans, they actually, the state after approval sent a clarification letter to specify that they were not holding the city to any numeric limit on the chlorine coming out of the end of the pipe. DEC's approval was based on basically, as I understand it, try your best. And that puts you in compliance if you try your best. That's, that's not the way we should be regulating sewage and, and toxic discharges in New York City. Um, one additional point I think that's vital to raise on the issue of chlorination is that, you know, this is a conversation that the City Council should be having that's broader than just the minimum required water quality regulation floor that the City has to hit with state approval. It's important to note that raw CSO discharges have many more things in it than indicator bacteria. What, what disinfection does is kill the bacteria that we use to gauge the problems inherent in the whole system of that water, the whole group of pollution that comes out. There's odors, there's biological oxygen demand, there's sediment oxygen demand, there's organic material, there's viruses, there's cigarette butts, there are a host of other things that I won't say because we don't know who's watching the live cast. So this is something that I think is, is important to note that capturing that, that sewage uh, and that stormwater, everything that comes off of our streets, if you capture that, it can be treated. If you're just chlorinating that one thing that we use to indicate the risk factor for the whole pollution, the plug of pollution that comes out in a storm, then what you're doing is you're closing your eyes to the broader problem, uh, and you're doing that only so that you can hit some sort of a, a minimum set by the, the state. And so it's incumbent upon us as advocates, I think as a city, to come together and recognize that the, that the problem is broader than just fecal indicator bacteria. Okay, thank you all for your testimony, and we look forward uh, con to continuing to work with you uh, to push DEP. And I want to thank you for all the, uh, the work you've been doing on this, going back to my day as a chair. So we look forward to continuing to work with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, we're going to go to the next panel. Dr. Tim Eaton, Queens College, Earth and Environmental Sciences. Judith Weiss, Rutgers University, scientists. Anel Hernandez, New York City Environmental Justice <coughs> Alliance. I believe Rob Krudorov, Krudorov and Associates. We have everyone. So Dr. Tim Eaton, Judith Weiss, Anel Hernandez, Rob Krudorov. <coughs> Can you please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Ready, you may begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for hearing uh, my testimony. My name is Tim Eaton. I'm uh, an associate professor of hydrology and earth and environmental sciences at Queens College. Uh, I'd like to speak uh, today about uh, some of the issues that have been raised with regard to green infrastructure and the long-term control plan. Uh, I've been following this issue for more than 10 years now, uh, attending many of the long-term control plan meetings. And um, I think that uh, the, the DEP is right when it says that the water quality in general has improved greatly over the last few decades, but it's also correct when it says that uh, our standards are much higher now than they used to be. And I want to commend there the DEP for its existing green infrastructure uh, program, but uh, it's not adequate. The whole point of green infrastructure is to capture stormwater before it enters the pipe system, the infrastructure. Uh, and this is an important point because uh, about four-fifths of the volume in the CSO is actually stormwater. So if you capture it before it enters the system, you're ahead of the game. And the whole point of green infrastructure is to do this. And one of the problems with the green infrastructure program at the DEP is that it has the overly modest goal of capturing stormwater on only 10% of the New York City impervious surface, and that's inadequate to actually make a significant reduction in CSO uh, discharges. Many other cities, such as Toronto and Philadelphia, for example, have much more aggressive and ambitious goals. Uh, furthermore, the second point I wanted to make, oh, uh, before I go on, I, I think it's pretty clear that the green infrastructure program of the DEP is not the centerpiece of its efforts to control CSO. And it really should be, for the reason I mentioned, because if you can capture uh, this, any of the stormwater that goes into the combined sewage, you're ahead of the game, because that's the majority of the volume. Uh, and you can see this from a comparison of funding that's allocated or projected to the green infrastructure program, which is considerably less than is planned to be spent on gray infrastructure. So uh, basically, the, the CSO long-term control plan by the New York City DEP is far too dominated by end-of-pipe gray infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, the, the proposed CSO retention tunnel under, under Astoria Boulevard, which is proposed to mitigate uh, the stormwater from, uh, or the, the CSO into Flushing Bay, is not going to even begin construction before 2021 and not due to be completed before 2035. And so there would be no retention for another 20 years, essentially. I don't think that's a wise allocation of funding. A much better approach would be to greatly expand the green infrastructure program uh, to uh, focus on capturing stormwater at the source, on the streets, before it goes into the program goes into the pipe system, and there is plenty of uh, examples of how this has worked in the New York City and elsewhere. The New York, the Staten Island Blue Belt is a good example of this. Uh, it's estimated that uh, 
such facilities uh, as, have, as has been um, uh, green roofs, um, impervious parking lots, or pervious parking lots, uh, rain gardens, uh, stormwater treatment wetlands could capture as much as 25 to 35 percent of stormwater in the streets before it ever gets into the sewage pipe infrastructure. So I'm sorry I went a little bit over. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Judith Weiss. I'm a professor emerita from Rutgers University in Newark. I'm an estuarine ecologist, and I've spent 40 years studying the waters and the life in the waters in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. I am the co-chair uh, of the Science and Technical Advisory Committee for the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program. And this is what I have studied for most of my career. I've watched the improvement over the 40 years of, of our waters, they were practically unlivable in, in 1970, but there's a lot of life there. It's, the biodiversity has increased greatly. But just because there are things that are a lot of diversity there, it doesn't mean that everything is, is fine. Uh, we've studied the uh, behavior of animals in the water, small fishes and crabs, and notice their feeding behavior is abnormal. Predator-prey interactions are, are impaired, which affects the food chain. Uh, when predators can't catch their prey, they can't grow well or live as long, and it just sets the whole thing out of balance. Um, so there's still a way to go. And um, I'm also going to talk about green infrastructure. I don't know him, but we've got a lot of the same opinions. And uh, the other kind of green infrastructure, one that I've studied a great deal, is salt marshes, natural infrastructure. Salt marshes used to be extremely abundant around the city, and we have filled in huge numbers of them, uh, huge amounts for building on and, and making airports and everything like that. The salt marshes we have now are not enough. We have restoration programs going on. This should be increased greatly because marshes act as sponges. They absorb a lot of water before it gets, of rainwater before it gets into the harbor. Uh, the, you get a double benefit. It's not just absorbing the stormwater. The marshes are absorbing carbon dioxide. They're absorbing the nitrogen pollution that, that causes pollution problems. And they, um, by, re, by absorbing carbon dioxide, they're helping uh, to reduce the issues of global warming, climate change. Uh, so they, multiple benefits. And I would also like to mention uh, bioswales and rain gardens as also green infrastructure with multiple benefits. They uh, are not only absorbing stormwater, they are also, as plants growing, absorbing carbon dioxide to reduce global warming. Uh, one final thing, I saw a wonderful bioswale on Columbus Avenue in the 80s some years ago with a sign explaining what it was. It was a wonderful educational thing, and I thought, this is terrific. We should have this on every block. And I haven't seen any more. And what's one in a neighborhood? Uh, I mean, it does nothing. So uh, there should be a great increase in, in the rain gardens, bioswales, and, um, in, and pervious pavement for parking lots and sidewalks. Thank you. Amen. Good morning, my name is Anel Hernandez and I'm here to testify in support of expanding green infrastructure on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low-income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. We empower our members to advocate for improved conditions and against inequitable burdens. And through our efforts, our member organizations coalesce around specific issues that threaten the, our, the ability of our communities to thrive and coordinate campaigns designed to affect city and state policies, including green infrastructure and climate resiliency more broadly. 
Because a number of our member organizations come from communities overburdened by lack of green spaces, proximity to potential waterfront toxic exposures, and air pollution from dirty industries clustered in their neighborhoods, our organization is a key advocate of green infrastructure, or GI. Um, our New York City Climate Justice Agenda, a multi-year research and advocacy campaign to address the need for comprehensive community-based community -based approaches to community resiliency. Um, in 2017, we released a report and it analyzed the Mayor de Blasio's One NYC plan and made several recommendations to strengthen the city's policies, including green infrastructure as an essential piece of integrated climate adaptation and mitigation planning. With rising flood risks, increasing temperatures, and air pollution, the city must continue to prioritize an aggressive expansion of GI and other complementary urban forestry and ecologically grounded coastal protection investments in environmental justice communities facing disproportionate burdens. In pursuit of a just transition, New York City should be leading the nation in the innovative GI strategies that meet our ambitious environmental and resiliency targets. We commend DEP for successfully constructing over 4,000 green infrastructure assets across the five boroughs in the last few years. We recognize the efforts that DEP has made to work across agencies to facilitate the constructions of GI on our streets, public lands, and private properties. Um, in particular, the dramatic expansion of GI in neighborhoods that are disproportionately vulnerable to extreme heat, including Bed-Stuy and Bushwick in Brooklyn and Soundview in the Bronx, is an important climate resiliency strategy. Going forward, DEP should work to increase maintenance in these neighborhoods that to date have seen these new bioswales and rain gardens collect debris and trash. Additionally, we ask that DEP work to expand their current targeted neighborhoods to include other EJ communities in need of GI, including the South Bronx and Sunset Park. Finally, we urge DEP to increase citywide engagement with community-based organizations as they plan for these future investments and neighborhood level engagement in finalizing designs of new and much needed GI assets, as well as public information on the modernizations and coastal protections of the wastewater treatment plant themselves. Um, in addition to improving the water quality of waterways, as, as many folks are talking about here today, GI provides critical co-benefits, including mitigating heat, improving air quality, enhancing coastal resiliency projects, reducing energy demand, and creating local workforce development opportunities. The creation of new job opportunities for maintenance is promising, and we are eager to see additional job growth as the GI program continues to expand. Um, furthermore, uh, we commend DEP for expanding the GI grant program to include the city's significant maritime and industrial areas. As part of our Waterfront Justice Project, we have advocated for increasing coastal resiliency and other best management strategies to prevent toxic exposures during extreme weather events and storm surges. And by expanding these targeted areas to MS4, in addition to the CSO areas, DEP will hopefully um, increase the climate resiliency of these industrial businesses and working waterfronts. So we commend the City Council for having this hearing today, and we look forward to continuing to work with uh, both the Council and DEP on improving uh, stormwater management strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Crowderoof. I run an environmental consultancy that specializes in designing and administering uh, projects which are funded through the DEP Green Infrastructure Grant Program. In the interest of time, I will summarize my testimony. Uh, we have had, on the one hand, great success in acquiring more than a million dollars for clients through DEP's program, as well as a complementary pilot program uh, run by HPD. Uh, however, there are substantial barriers to, to participation, which I'd like to focus on today. Uh, we alone have uh, client, potential clients with more than uh, four acres. Uh, of a space which they would like to green should they qualify for the program. Uh, this is affordable housing, but they're not able to qualify for legal reasons. Uh, green infrastructure on private property constitutes just one-third of one percent of DEP's total capital expenditures to date. Uh, that's much too low. Uh, and uh, the good news is the grant program has a strong foundation that can be expanded upon and I believe could be a, a foundational program that could transform the marketplace in the city with some modest improvements. The, cover, the program covers the full cost of projects, has a large overall budget, um, allows third-party administration of projects, uh, and DEP itself has fantastic staff that administers the program. 
Um, however, the primary issue with the program is there's a restrictive covenant which is intended to ensure projects are remain on the property for 20 years and are well maintained, but it goes way above and beyond what's necessary and winds up getting in the way of program participation. Uh, most significantly, there's a, a, an overly stringent subordination clause um, that requires projects to small, relatively small grant programs, uh, grant projects to be subordinate to much larger uh, loans, in addition to a host of other issues which uh, I've laid out here. There are two p potential uh, options or solutions which I'd like to put forth uh, to the committee. First, the city should consider the use of expense funding rather than bond funding for the grant program, which, is, which would enable DEP much greater discretion about how they um, uh, regulate participation in the program. The second possibility would be to um, continue using bond funding, uh, but to provide a series of improvements to the restrictive covenant and the program more largely, uh, uh, both ad addressing uh, a number of the barriers that, that I've uh, laid out in uh, the written testimony, as well as allowing the buyout of green infrastructure projects. So developers which may sell their property or plan on selling their property are not put off by the program. They could instead pay uh, in based on the time that is um, um, uh, th that the DEP otherwise expected the project to be in place. Lastly, there should be a specialized pre-approved restrictive covenant specifically for affordable housing, which has uh, both a lot of interest and a particularly high number of barriers for participation in this program. Uh, this would open up a whole other marketplace. So uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Uh, I want to thank this panel very much. Um, in the interest of time, because we do have a lot of panelists, um, I'm going to withhold any questions, but um, certainly I look forward to working with all of you. As you know, we're um, approaching a new session, so there's going to be opportunities, I think, in the, in the, in the coming term uh, to work on a lot of these issues. Uh, Rob, I, we were on a panel together a couple of years ago and, and uh, certainly on, on issues around uh, green infrastructure and, and, uh, and green roofs. We want to uh, make uh, significant strides. And uh, sorry, the gentleman on, on the right, I didn't uh, get your name. And I okay. Tim Eaton. Tim Eaton. Um, so you spoke about you know what other cities are doing. And at, from that panel, I remember Toronto and DC and Philadelphia um, uh, having really good uh, models that we have yet to follow. So um, obviously, you know, we're probably bigger than all three of those cities combined. Um, so uh, we can uh, be a real leader in this field, and we haven't yet. So I look forward to working with all of you, the EJ community as well, uh, on, uh, on advancing a lot of these uh, really great ideas uh, in the coming term. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next panel, Greg O'Mullen from Queens College, Lisa Bloodgood from Neighbors Allied for Good Growth, Matt Molina from NYC H2O, and uh, uh, Catherine Hughes from Storm Surge Working Group. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Okay. Whoever would like to begin. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Greg O'Mullen. I'm a tenured professor in the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Queens College. Let me begin by acknowledging that average water quality in New York Harbor has significantly improved in recent decades. This did not happen by accident. It occurred as a result of significant investment in wastewater treatment plants. However, water quality remains severely polluted in many city waterways, out of compliance with New York State water quality standards due to combined sewer overflow. 
It is now time for the city to take the next step in addressing water quality by eliminating CSO pollution and having a comprehensive plan for how to eliminate CSO pollution. The only full solution to this issue will occur from massive reduction and capture via green and gray infrastructure, and this is where the city's investment should be focused and where in place efforts should be supported in this, in this regard. When sewage enters a waterway, it delivers a wide variety of pollutant types, including pathogenic microbes, oxygen-consuming waste, nutrients, chemical toxins, pharmaceuticals, metals, floatables. Management strategies such as CSO chlorination that target, that target a single symptom of sewage contamination will still leave our waterways heavily polluted, despite major investment. The city's commitment of resources for long-term control plan solutions represents the major opportunity to address our century-old CSO problem and these funds should be used to address the full range of CSO-related pollutants. Chlorination is a useful component of treating sewage pollution in our wastewater treatment plants, but, but in modern wastewater treatment, it is part of a process, and it typically occurs in a more controlled environment. End of pipe, <coughs> pardon me, end of pipe CSO chlorination is much more complicated to control, is less tested, would be expected to be less efficient as a result of factors such as particle loading and limited contact time, and has concerns including harmful chlorination byproducts and excess chlorine delivered to um, waterways. In waterways such as Flushing Creek, the proposed CSO chlorination is a band-aid solution that treats sing a single component of the broader problem. A retention tank built a decade ago in Flushing uh, was a step in the right direction, but additional action beyond CSO chlorination is still needed. Resources should be focused on CSO reduction and capture, otherwise only single components of the problem will be addressed. This is not an issue only for those who recreate in waterways. In the days following Hurricane Sandy, I was visiting the neighborhoods um, where there were flooded streets and buildings adjacent to Newtown Creek. This is not just about recreation. As a research scientist, I've been involved in common water quality monitoring, but I've also utilized methods that extend far beyond typical monitoring approaches and those that are often reported associated with long-term control plan reports. For example, my laboratory has been involved in establishing the connection of CSO pollution to the distribution of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. We've published on bacterial and metal contamination in CSO overflow from Alley Creek. We've partnered with the EPA recently to study pharmaceuticals and emerging uh, chemical tracers uh, for sewage pollution in local waterways. There are good reasons to be concerned about the full range of sewage contaminants, even beyond those that have, been, that have established state water quality standards. I've recently utilized continuous oxygen sensors that have documented extensive oxygen depletion far beyond what's represented in most uh, available reports. The only management solution that will address all of these concerns is CSO reduction and capture. I urge you to support CSO reduction and capture as the primary long-term control plan solution in all waterways. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And if you have copies of your testimony or can make copies and, and uh, send them to us, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so thank you, council members, for your time and members of the committee for having this important hearing today. My name is Lisa Bloodgood. I am the education coordinator for Newtown Creek Alliance. I previously worked as liaison and aide to council member Levin. And I am a member of the Newtown Creek CAG Superfund Steering Committee I'm also a resident of North Brooklyn, but I'm here today speaking as a board member and representative of Al uh, Neighbors Allied for Good Growth, also known as NAG, an organization developed in the early 1990s out of our neighborhood's desire to recapture its waterfront, reduce local environmental hazards, and advocate for public policies promoting healthy mixed-use communities. We advocate with and for the people who live and work in the North Brooklyn neighborhoods of Greenpoint and Williamsburg, and our approach to these issues is guided by the principle that our entire community is entitled to participate in decision-making and negotiating processes affecting our neighborhood, leadership of local mobilization efforts, and the design of a future vision for our community. So the neighborhoods of North Brooklyn are proud waterfront communities that have spent years fighting for access for their waterfronts and to the, for the cleanups that the waters they are fighting, fighting to access. We are in the final stages of seeing a major upgrade to the Newtown Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility, the largest wastewater treatment plant in the city, and it treats waste from Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. We are working now towards a clean Newtown Creek, a federal Superfund site, uh, long contaminated by industry, um, but experiences ongoing contamination that still plagues the water body as a result of billions of gallons of combined sewage overflows every year. 
With the DEP's long-term control plan, we will see only a 60% reduction, and we are deep, deeply concerned with DEP's announced plans for abatement. Uh, the Newtown Creek will continue to be befouled at rain events, which are projected to be more and more frequent. We are also deeply troubled by the lack of the public's ability to engage in deciding our water body's fate. Yes, there were public meetings, but there were no public comment periods. Uh, there was no opportunity to truly weigh in on the proposed plan, neither through these public comment periods or through our elected representatives. Since we were not allowed a seat at the table, we deserve an explanation as to why we were not and why did the DEP feel it uh, necessary to work with people of the city in developing these plans, why they didn't feel the necessary. Ultimately, a uh, 60% reduction is okay, but certainly not enough, and we should all demand a better solution. Our neighborhoods deserve more, and so does the city of New York. Uh, we are not a city, and North Brooklyn is not a community that will be content with notices to stay out of the water after rain events, especially as we are now in the process of experiencing exponential growth in North Brooklyn. Right to know laws are certainly helpful, but they are not a solution to this problem, nor should we expect or accept that they are an acceptable replacement for clean water. Neither is chlorina chlorination nor aeration. The 2005 rezoning of the Williamsburg and Greenfront waterfront, waterfront has already brought thousands of new residents to our community, and the real density build out has only just begun. We will see tens of thousands of newcomers in the next 10 years and many will look to water as an extension of the open space we need to be healthy and happy people. We are already seeing a burgeoning boating community and we expect this to continue to grow as our waterfront is further developed. People want to and should be able to swim, fish, and otherwise recreate in our waters without fear of being made ill or swimming through CSO-released floatables. Um, I no, I heard my bell, but I do want to keep going on. I just want to, in summary, we want to seat at the decision-making table. We need our voices to be heard. We have lived alongside bespoiled waters for too long, and we don't think demanding clean water is too much to ask. We, in fact, believe it is our right. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Matt Molina. Thank you to the committee for allowing me to testify. I'm the director and founder of NYC H2O. We are a nonprofit organization that provides education programs about New York's water system. Like the students that were here today, we bring kids outside on field trips to teach about the water system on site and up close. We bring them to the city's historic reservoirs there's one in every borough because everybody has to drink water. And we bring them to beaches and wetlands so that they can, again, learn right, right in front of them how our water system works. So these students, and there have been 12,000 over the past four years, get to d d directly see what's going on and what happens when sewage goes right into the waters. Uh, we actually, and I have a picture of it, we use seine nets and catch fish and other critters and uh, the students get to touch them and, and see them themselves, and they see that the, the wildlife is directly affected by these CSOs. Um, about the, the Flushing Creek and the plan to chlorinate it, one of the things that we do is we bring uh, people also to sewage treatment plants. The way sewage treatment plants use chlorine is at the end, the very end, before the water is returned back to the rivers, it's put in a tank and it's, they put a little bleach in it and it sits there for about half a minute and that contact time is necessary for the chlorine to do its job to kill the bacteria. What they're proposing here is just to put the, the chlorine in and say, oh, let's see what happens. It's, 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 it's not the right situation. It's a controlled environment in a sewage plant, but to put it just in pipes you know, as, as the, the combined sewers are uh, overflowage is going into the Flushing Creek, it, that doesn't work. Uh, in addition to that, after the, the chlorine is put in at a sewage plant, it is then zapped with um, another chemical to take out the chlorine. That doesn't seem to be any part of the plan. Okay, um, just to finish up, there are two um, very significant uh, green infrastructure proposals that the city has been considering for, for a couple of decades, and I actually have the proposals and the studies done by the city. One is daylighting uh, the Tibbetts Brook, which 
would not cost very much money. It's in the tens of millions of dollars. And considering that the city spent over $100 million to secure Bushlet Inlet, Inlet Park, it's, it's a very um, doable plan. Um, uh, and um, uh, the second one is to actually use the water, like in the reservoir in Central Park, to, for the park's irrigation. Right now, tap water is used. Well, there's a, a billion gallon reservoir in Central Park. Why not just use that water for its, this, the park's use? So that there are very achievable uh, green infrastructure proposals. Um, we hope that the city would, will use them. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, New York City Council Member Levine and other members of the uh, Committee on Environmental Protection. My name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. I served 20 years on Manhattan Community Board One for more than half of that time as chair or vice chair. After Superstorm Sandy, I was appointed co chair of New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program for Southern Manhattan. I'm also a founding member of CB1's Manhattan Tip Resiliency Task Force and a member of the New York Harbor Regional Storm Surge Barrier Working Group. Um, I speak as a 30-year downtown resident and proud of what we have built and rebuilt in Lower Manhattan and my concern about how the city's wastewater infrastructure will function in the age of climate change, extreme weather events, and rising sea levels. Over five years ago, Superstorm Sandy overwhelmed the current uh, stormwater control plan and combined sewer overflow. It just did not work um, as sewage backed up into our buildings and washed up into our streets and buildings. The need for CSO and storm water discharge investments drives me to speak about sea level rise and storm surge protection. Without those latter investments, the investments in CSO and storm surge water controls either will be ineffective or quickly become obsolete. The ability for CSOs and storm water to discharge both during and after a storm is uh, predicated on gravity discharge to surrounding water levels that will be much higher in the future due to sea level rise and higher still during the storms that cause coastal flooding. While you know, and I know this, the attendees to this hearing may not realize it and we have to be able to put the two together immediately. Yesterday at the New York City Council Committee on Recovery and Resilience Oversight Hearing, it became clear that the future of FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program and its reauthorization are unclear, and that new flood maps are expected to come out in about five years. In the meantime, scientific data increasingly points to climate change as a major threat to New York City, Moody's. A major credit rating agency recently added climate to credit risks and warned cities to address their climate exposure or face rating downgrades. We do not know if and how much federal government will assist in the rebuilding our communities after the next superstorm, Sandy, which costs $19 billion in repairs. And some downtown infrastructure is still under repair, such as the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. According to a recent Princeton University research, climate change will worsen inequality in our society if underserved communities become uninhabitable. Migration, some planned and some in panic, will stress already overburdened social welfare systems and infrastructure. The best way to mitigate these effects to limit is to limit the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. It is more important than ever for New York City to be a leader to protect our roughly 500 miles of coastline. In the meantime, the city must construct a layer coastal fence of local seawalls and regional storm surge barriers to address future storm surges, a 20 to 25 foot high uh, shore regional New York, New Jersey metro regional storm surge barrier. One, would avoid the complex hydrogeological built infrastructure and uh, social uh, issues faced by the current dual purpose uh, projects. Two, could protect the metro area for the next 100 years Three, would protect more communities than the current projects for the same $20 billion. I also want to make sure um, that in terms of uh, reducing greenhouse gases, the local law that's called Intro 1745 before New York City Council has no deadlines between you know, now and 2020, so it will be very hard for New York City to reach its commitment of 1.5 degrees centigrade. And just to show you what we're going to look like if 1.5 degrees centigrade is not achieved. So this is why um, we have the color maps for you. And um, the, the last item is, since 
you know, as a large investor, the city, and also as the hub of global financial system, the city needs to support the work of the Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures to advance climate risk disclosures worldwide. Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, a nonprofit, runs this campaign called Disclose What Matters that spearheads the call from investors and companies to disclose material uh, substantially issues such as climate risk in financial filings. Resiliency means much more than building walls at the waterfront and the greatest city in the world can overcome the challenge of climate change and show the way for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine, on that map, the, the, the blue, that's, that's the actual sea level rise. Right so um, there are two scenarios here and it's from an incredible website called Climate Central and you can put in different scenarios. So um, the lower one is 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is bad already. And I, you know, the district I live in here is down here. We got a pro problem here in lower Manhattan. I know you do over there in Brooklyn as well. Yeah. So what the city, and then also on the prior page is the official sea level rise projections for New York City from uh, the Columbia University has some uh, amazing research center called the Earth Institute. I have to disclose I'm on their advisory board. Um, and the Sabine Center uh, for Climate Law Change has this map, uh, this chart. So which scenario we're gonna be able to lock in of you know how rapidly the sea level is going to rise is really important. And then this clearly is a map. Um, you know, is New York City gonna defend its 500 miles of coastal line or do a storm surge barrier what they would do in Holland, which is just five miles. Yeah, yeah, which is obviously my district on this map at, at four, uh, four degrees centigrade. Um, you know, my, my district is mostly underwater. <laughs> and what, well, one, one of the little things just for greenhouse gases, um, some of you might recall the dirty heating oil, remember that? Number six, number four, number two, Community Board One worked a lot on that, but also with the EDF Environmental Defense Fund. And it turns out there are roughly 400 uh, Department of Education schools as burning number four heating oil. So that would be an easy fit for the city to be a leader to decrease its carbon footprint in the next several years. Great. And it would I improve air quality as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much this entire panel. Uh, and thank you for, for keeping, um, keeping the city's feet to the fire on all these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Next panel, Laura uh, Spalter, Karen Argenti, um, both from uh, Bronx Community Board 8 and Bronx Council for Environmental Quality, Michelle Langa, New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, um, and Harvey L. Simon um, uh, from uh, Sunnyside, Queens. <clears throat> And I apologize in advance, I have to go chair a hearing at 1 p.m. across the street, so I'm gonna, uh, by the way, I'm Steve Levin, and so I'm filling in for Councilmember Constantinidis, took over from Councilmember Richards, and I will be handing it over to Councilmember Perkins, so. Can you please raise your right hand? And do you swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Hi, my name is Karen Argenti. I'm with the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality. We're an all Bronx environmental group. Um, and we're made up of volunteers. I'm just gonna go really quick because everybody mentioned every, almost all the points I was gonna talk about. I'm just gonna enhance them a little bit. Um, we're particularly interested in the hall. Karen, event. push the microphone a little closer so we can. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Um, we're particularly interested in the Harlem River. We're gonna start the East River Open Waters Long-Term Control Plan. The kickoff meeting is at the end of January and we're really excited about that. Um, but it is a long time waiting. And it is probably the worst um, 
water body, the Harlem River, in the city, um, the largest outfall and with the largest subcatch basin area is in that area. It's W O W I O five six, and that discharges more than a billion gallons a year, and um, that's really not helpful. It's a tier one, and it should have really been taken care of first. Part of the the fix for this project would be to do the daylighting of Tibbetts Brook, including the purchase of CSX property, um, which has already been mentioned, how the daylighting would be so important. I consider that to be a large green infrastructure project. Um, and it could be if, uh, if you want to cut down the amount of water that's going into the river, because 056 even discharges during the dry weather. Um, Okay, and then the other thing is, is that, you know, now that we're starting in 2018, it's probably going to be like 15 to 20 years before anything happens based on the way that the DEP does their projects. Um, and that's because they spend most of their time doing the gray infrastructure. Um, other cities don't do that. If you look at what goes on in Philadelphia and in Washington, D.C. and some others, they have a goal. I didn't hear anybody talk about a goal. I didn't hear anybody talk about uh, improving water quality, not just taking it to a certain level, but improving it constantly. Um, the, what percentage of the discharge are they focused on removing? How, are they going to minimize flooding? And what is the schedule, the budget? It seems to me their plan is all about the budget, and we should be talking about other items. But I want to talk a little bit about green infrastructure. Other cities know that green infrastructure is the quicker, less invasive, and more economical option. The DEP GI plan manages 10% of the impervious area. It is included in the long-term control plan as a baseline, but it doesn't propose any new green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is better for the natural environment, the current, and the current design guidelines only captures a small rain events. Given the increase in rainfall intensity expected with climate change, they could do better by increasing the use of GE, like extending the design to capture more than just more severe rain events. Um, there's other things they could do. Um, I, we, we're also interested in the MS4 program. And then I would just like to say that one of the things we could also ask is they shouldn't be doing an environmental assessment after they chose this preferred alternative. Since we're talking about scientific information, they should do the assessment and make it public. And if it's necessary to do an environmental impact statement, that should be done also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Spalter. I'm the chair of the environment. Laura, you're not on, I don't think. You've got to press the button. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon. My name is Laura Spalter. I am the chair of the Environment and Sanitation Committee of Bronx Community Board 8. On behalf of Bronx Community Board 8, I would like to thank the committee for holding this hearing to address the serious impacts of combined sewer overflows on our city's water bodies and communities. As chair of Bronx Community Board 8's Environment and Sanitation Committee, I took the opportunity to ask Mayor de Blasio the following question during last February's town hall meeting in the Bronx. When will Bronx Community Board 8 be included in the DEP's long-term control plan uh, to address our serious CSO and local flooding problems? Then Acting Commissioner Vincent Sapienza responded that our issues are very important to the DEP and they are looking at the Harlem River located in Community Board 8. On April 12, 2016, Community Board 8 passed and sent a resolution to then DEP Commissioner Emily Lloyd and our elected officials advocating for the daylighting of Tibbetts Brook both inside and outside of Van Cortland Park. It noted that during and after rainstorms, the large volume of clean water from Tibbetts Brook overwhelms the Wards Island stormwater treatment plant beyond its capacity, causing raw, untreated sewage to be discharged into the Harlem River in violation of the Clean Water Act. 
Daylighting Tibbetts Brook, along with the addition of green infrastructure to absorb stormwater runoff, would reduce CSO and help alleviate our severe flooding issues along the Broadway corridor. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on this critical environmental and public health issue, which has long been a priority for the Environment and Sanitation Committee. Um, I have a question. Uh, it was said earlier by DEP that they have a goal of a rain garden on every street. Um, will there be an increase in resources to adequately maintain the, the rain gardens, to keep them free of garbage, debris, watering, and that type of thing? Please consider that piece with the increase of green infrastructure. Otherwise, as Chair of Environment and Sanitation, I will hear about it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Harvey Simon. I'm a public member of Queens Community Board Number 2. And although I have objections and an alternative to chlorine, I may be in the wrong church or the right church in the wrong pew. I think the, uh, the alternative of ultraviolet light as a disinfectant, uh, as effective as chlorine, more to water treatment than actually through the sewers. But indeed, it is still a medical fact, simple ultraviolet light is also a viable means of disinfectant that would be completely non-toxic as, uh, as an alternative and effective and economical alternative. To, it would be a methodology that didn't need mitigation, just maintenance. That, that's the crux of my uh, presentation since all the other experts here were indeed experts. Just one thing anecdotally. Locally, Trader Joe's and Whole Foods already have paper bags. And by experience, they're, they're effective alternatives to any plastic bag. So I think anecdotally and experientially, it's a moot point to even discuss paper bags when we already have effective paper bags and extent with handles. In my day, we didn't even have those handles. So, so thank you for the opportunity to partner with the committee and the city council today. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Michelle Langham with New York, New Jersey Baykeeper. I just wanted to add a couple of points to the discussion and then add uh, one more thing from a bi-state perspective. Um, we believe that the current plans that are in place, long-term control plans, are not um, protective enough of public health and will not enable the city to reach water quality standards, and that should be addressed and strengthened going forward. Um, we believe the plan should focus on reducing the flow to outfalls rather than focus on cleaning the water that is coming out of them. Um, one of the benefits of reducing the flow is that, as many of the people before me have said, there's less contamination to deal with at the end to begin with. Um, and finally, the, the standards set in New York City are the lead for New Jersey's long-term control plans. We're a little bit behind in the process. And we look to New York because we share so many waterways to lead the way and, and have the highest possible standards so that we can also push for the highest possible standards on our side of the rivers and bays. That's all for today. Thanks. So as we approach the highest possible standards, how do we calculate that in dollars and cents? No, oh, please, Chair. Good. I just asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that we have the answer to that question. Um, How do you go about getting such an answer? Because obviously there are costs involved. Mm -hmm. There are, yeah. Um, one of the metrics to, to judge it by is the testing that you do. Um, switching to the enterococcus standard over the fecal standard is more indicative of the things that are harmful. Um, there are costs involved with switching to that standard, but those are going to be dependent on how often you test, where you test, how frequently you test, how many different waterways at a time. And those are things that the companies and the people who would be doing the testing would have to investigate. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to take one second just to acknowledge um, uh, Laura Sporter and Karen Argente are truly, they're, they're environmental heroes in Community Board 8 in the Northwest Bronx. Um, I knew nothing about sewers when I was elected to, uh, to the City Council, and shockingly, I represent an area with a very complicated sewer system. I have a network of very old private sewers. I have all sorts of uh, interesting things going on with my sewage. Um, uh, but it's really uh, the advocacy of, of you two in particular and, and, and like-minded people uh, that have raised uh, the clarion call about Tibbetts Brook. I, I believe, you know, that one day we're going to get there. I don't know when that's going to be, but I, I do believe that we're going to get there, that the, the obviousness of that project, uh, the, the profound impact it could have on water quality and the Harlem River, uh, and that it just makes so much sense, uh, and your hard work and advocacy, I uh, just want you to know, is recognized and appreciated by me, so I wanted everyone down here to know that too. So thank you. Excuse me, if I may, one second. I just wanted to thank Donovan Richards for intro 446-A. It's on the record. Thank you. <laughs> so the next panel, uh, Will Willis Elkins, Michelle Lubeck, did I? <clears throat> Alexandra Herzen, am I saying your name right? And uh, Aziz Deghan. Fancy names. <laughs> Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Yes. Great, thank you. My name is Willis Elkins. I'm a Greenpoint resident, chair of the Environmental Committee for Brooklyn Community Board 1, co-chair of the Newtown, Newtown Creek Superfund CAG, an avid waterway user. Today, I offer testimony as my, on my position as the program manager for the Newtown Creek Alliance. Our organization has served as a leading community voice for the cleanup of one of the country's most dirtiest, one of the country's dirtiest waterways located in the geographic center of New York City. In addition to a legacy of toxic contamination, Newtown Creek is severely impaired by the release of untreated sewage. Um, in relationship to the long-term control plan that was submitted this summer for approval, uh, we would like to talk about uh, the storage tunnel that would, uh, would capture approximately 60% of sewage overflow from the three largest outfalls on the creek. While we are encouraged to see this investment in large-scale infrastructure, we are extremely discouraged by the lengthy timeline that's proposed. The tunnel would not be completed until the year 2042, a full 20 years from now. For perspective, Newtown Creek will not have a chance of even meeting Clean Water Act standards until a full 70 years from when the legislation was passed. This lengthy timeline ensures ongoing pollution and resulting threats to human health and, wild, and local wildlife for decades to come. Also, I would like to reference uh, Sean Dixon from Riverkeeper also talked about how those standards are not even up to date with EPA standards, so very bad situation. Additionally, while we applaud the strong investment in building out the proposed underground storage tunnel, we also hold true to a basic principle that sewage does not belong in our waterways. We believe that a 60% reduction is a positive step in the right direction, but we need to not only reduce the volume of sewage overflow, but the frequency of when overflow events are occurring. The most active CSOs in Newtown Creek currently discharge approximately 42 times per year. The proposed plan would cut that by an estimated 55% to 19 discharges per year. But as you've heard from other places around the harbor, New York, uh, Newtown Creek is actually getting uh, one of the best plans that's been submitted so far. Most of the other bodies around New York City will not see this sort of reduction, and we can look forward to um, weekly discharges on average of CSO for decades to come. Uh, to which we ask, are these really long-term plans? Uh, it may bring us into seasonal compliance with complicated numerical standards regarding bacteria levels during recreational seasons, but do we as residents of New York City and as leaders of New York City accept sewage in our waterways as an inevitable fact of life? If the city can tackle other serious human environmental health issues with targets not of mitigation but elimination, why can't we do the same for stormwater? 
We have things like Vision Zero for transportation, zero waste for sanitation. So I ask, where is our Vision Zero for sewage when it comes to environmental protection? It is here that we look not just to the folks from DEP, but from our elected leaders to set the highest of goals for protecting these great tidal waters that surround the archipelago we know as New York City. In closing, we'd like to encourage and explore the ex encourage the exploration and expansion of ideas and projects that can prevent the release of untreated sewage into our waterways. We've heard a lot about these already, but I would like to reiterate these, and I think it's important to talk about how we can enable DEP to do more to protect us. This includes dra dr drastically improving incentives for expanding green roofs on privately owned properties and buildings, requiring green infrastructure on all new buildings, requiring green infrastructure on all roadway redesign projects, better funding mechanisms for DEP, other agencies, and organizations to maintain green infrastructure projects, allowing design build to ex uh, expedite green infrastructure projects that the city is already actively pursuing and implementing, looking to stormwater fees and structuring rates to better finance stormwater infrastructure, improving communication about CSO events as they occur, as well as public outreach to promote less water use during rain events, and investment in research and development of permeable pavements. Lastly, not on this point, I'd also like to speak about the relationship between the city and the state. I think one of the big issues here is that the city, all these plans that they have submitted are only submitted because they're, away, they're allowed to get away with them. That the, they're doing as much as the state will do and that the connection between New York City and Albany on this process really needs significant improvement. Uh, once these plans are submitted, as you've heard, there's no formal process for feedback from community members. The state gives us consent order, and once that's happened, it's a done deal. And so we're looking at this 25 years of done deal, you know, for all these different waterways. And so we need to start working up, with, you know, with our partners upstate and talking to DEC about how we can better improve and address all of these issues that have been discussed so far today. So thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Michelle Lupke. I'm the Ecology Director for the Bronx River Alliance. I sit on the steering committee for the SWIM Coalition, and I'm also a member of the Bronx Community Board Two Environmental Committee. The Bronx River Alliance serves as a coordinated voice for the river and works in harmonious partnership with more than 100 organizations and agencies to protect, restore, and improve the Bronx River as an ecological, recreational, educational, and economic resource for the communities through which the river flows. Each year, through our diverse programming, we engage over 1,500 paddlers, 2,000 students and educators, and thousands of volunteers who come in contact with the river, some for the first time. We are deeply concerned about the impact of combined sewage overflows and polluted stormwater on the river's health and on the impact to human health for everyone who uses it as an educational and recreational resource. There's been a tremendous amount of investment in the Bronx River over the past few years, including working with the New York City Parks Department and the Wildlife Conservation Society to monitor American eel populations and installing a fish ladder and an eel passage at the 182nd Street Dam to connect migratory fish species to upstream freshwater habitat. An experimental oyster reef has been installed at the mouth of the river with promising results for the reestablishment of native oysters. This year, for the first time in a decade, we restocked river herring, helping create a self-sustaining population of fish that were once abundant in the Bronx River but whose populations declined due to overfishing and poor water quality. To protect these extensive investments and the progress which we have achieved, the long-term control plan for the Bronx River should reduce fecal pathogens, maintain dissolved oxygen that level the at levels that support aquatic life and control floatable trash. Following review of the Bronx River LTCP, we submit the following comments. Number one, capture, don't divert CSOs. You've been hearing a lot about this today. In the Bronx River alone, the 63% the decrease would still result in 285 million gallons per year of, of CSOs into the Bronx River, and that is at an estimated 31 annual overflow events. We therefore urge DEP to reduce combined sewage overflows as much as possible. Number two, we need more robust green infrastructure management and incentives for participation. The Bronx community has been an early advocate of green infrastructure, supporting the benefits it provides for the entire watershed. Uh, we need more increased green infrastructure in MS4 areas that not only promotes water quality benefits, but also other co-benefits such as cooling, air quality improvements, and pollinator habitat creation. In the long-term control plan for the Bronx River, 14% of the stormwater was supposed to have man been managed by the, by the modeling. 
However, to date, only 1.1% of impervious areas in the Bronx have been managed with stormwater, with no projects slated for 2017. This means that the predicted number of overflow events and the annual discharge volumes to the Bronx River will be significantly increased if these green infrastructure targets are not met. We, you've heard before about our, uh, the need for transparency. We are, did not receive our third public meeting. Waterway stewards must be provided the ample opportunity to engage and have our voices heard. And then fourth, the, you've heard this, the water quality standards are not up to date. We have been doing studies using Enterococcus, which is the national standard. We've also been doing um, floatable trash analysis, and to date we have pulled out 153,000 pieces of garbage from the Bronx River using volunteers. So thank you. We're encouraged to see that chlorination was taken off the table for the Bronx River Long-Term Control Plan. We thank the DEP for all of their efforts, and we look forward to working with them in the future moving forward so that we can have cleaner waterways. And thank you to the City Council for allowing us to testify today. Thank you. Thank you for your participation and your commitment, and we look forward to seeing what we can do to be helpful. Next. Um, hi, my name is Alex Herzan, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the Guardians of Flushing Bay, which is a consortium of dragon boat teams and concerned citizens who care about the safety and water quality of Flushing Creek and Flushing Bay, and more broadly, all of New York's surrounding waters. I really want to thank the City Council for having this hearing because um, I don't know that you have had a hearing on, on these issues in a very long time, and it's um, really, really needed. And as you saw, we, um, we, there are a lot of concerned citizens for whom this is important. As regular recreational users of Flushing Bay, we've been exposed to the deleterious effects of combined sewage overflows. After a rainfall, and it does not have to be very much, We've seen floating debris from, from condoms and tampons and other flushed items, as well as dead or dying animals. Dead rats and horseshoe crabs can be a fairly common sight after a rain. As recreational boaters who participate in dragon boating, which is the fastest growing water sport in America, we've, been, we've each been exposed to alarming levels of bacteria, viruses and toxic contaminants. Our teammates have suffered from rashes, diarrhea, eye infections, and other illnesses as a result of exposures to these waterways in the heart of one of the richest cities in the world, a city burdened with centuries-old sewage systems and a frustrating lack of commitment to clean, fishable, swimmable waterways. While we paddle and come into contact with water in Flushing Bay, the water quality is heavily impacted by Flushing Creek, which has been awarded the Golden Toilet Award by the New York City Water Trail Association Citizens Water Quality Testing Group because our citizen testing program revealed consistently high levels of bacteria in the water this past summer. This situation should not exist. It's solvable. It's approachable. It can be fixed now not after two decades. <laughs> Clean water will drive healthy communities, which in turn will drive resilient economies. City Council, we need your help. We need to invest more in our infrastructure now to prevent further deterioration of our waterways. The DEP's LTC plan that has been proposed and accepted by the state for Flushing Creek calls for chlorinating the, the creek sewers during the rec season, only during the recreational season, an unproven technology that will not mitigate even one gallon of CSO into the creek in the bay. For Flushing Bay, the proposal is for a CSO storage tunnel that will not be completed until 2035. Um, I just want to say, you know, why can't we capture not chlorinate our CSOs and get started now, not wait close to a decade to begin planning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Aziz Dekhan. I'm the executive director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. Um, two years ago, 
I pretty much didn't know anything about stormwater management until the uh, coalition received a grant from uh, GOSAR, the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, to put together a feasibility study and to build green infrastructure on the 47 community gardens on the Lower East Side. Um, we're in the second year of that project and we're about to begin to build infrastructure that will capture stormwater that go, before it goes into the combined sewer outflows. Um, actually, before, the, before this project, when I was about five years old and lived on West End Avenue near the ri river, I was always told, don't go in the river. And um, I'm pretty much told that right now, too. But that's another story. Um, what's slightly dismaying to me is that during this conversation, and I've been in this room for a few hours, um, the words community garden uh, have not been spoken. And I know, Councilman Perkins, you are one of our champions in community gardens, but I feel that that's a deficit because community gardens, there's 600 community gardens in New York City, and we can and we are going to prove through this project called Gardens Rising that, we, that these gardens can and will absorb water and will keep com combined sewer outflows um, cleaner and better managed. Um, one of the, one of the, one of the I, I guess one of the benefits of being one of the last people to speak is that I've heard so many other people. Uh, I, there was a, a professor from Rutgers, who, uh, and, and I'm an alumni from Rutgers, uh, she spoke about bioswales, and it's true. Uh, Manhattan, if you look at Manhattan, there are almost no bioswales in Manhattan. Uh, our project intends to build at least 10 bioswales and um, use those community gardens, use tree pits, use water tanks, use uh, permeable pavement, use all kinds of uh, uh, tree pits, all kinds of different green infrastructure that are already exist, and we can do this for about a mil under a million dollars in 47 community gardens. So when you talk about billions and billions and billions of dollars um, to be spent on projects that will take 20 years, 40 years out, I, I strongly urge everybody to take a look at a more reasonable look at how we can do this. And I understand the need to, to comply with the EPA, and I understand the work with the DEP. We work very closely with the DEP on this project, but I still would like to say in, in the 20 seconds I have left that it's important that we look at what we already have in this city. We are rich, but we are rich in resources that we currently have. 600 community gardens in New York City. That's all I want to remind you about. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next. We're done. <laughs> Eleanor Ray. Eleanor Ray. Andrea Parker. Rob Buckman. Buchanan. <laughs> Apologize about that. And Carmen Millian. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Um, hi, um, I'm Eleanor Ray. Oh, thank you. No, um, okay, thank you. <laughs> Eleanor Ray, uh, president and founder of the Hutchinson River Restoration Project. We are a very small 501c3, and um, I guess I would just like to mention a couple, a couple of things. I didn't come prepared because I didn't, didn't realize we could give testimony, I, but uh, I'm very pleased to be able to do it. Um, I did attend all the meetings that they had at the Hutchison River. They were very, very well attended, not only people from New York, but also a lot of people from Westchester because the Hutch does go from Scarsdale on to through six towns. So we really have to take into account you know, New, New York, Westchester, as well as the Bronx uh, when we talk about the Hutch. 
I am very dismayed by the plan that was chosen. And um, just on a pure dollars and cents thing, they say at the best of times it will impact 23% of bacteria. And that's not what's in the Hutchison River particularly. Uh, we, 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 well, okay. Uh, and my, my question would be, okay, so we are willing to spend $90 million to construct this thing with, with, with uh, chlorophyll and so forth and so on, but we are not willing to spend a penny to have public access to the river. As much as we say this is one of our priorities is access, there is no public access to the Hutchison River, either in the Bronx or in the six communities in Westchester. So how in the world are we gonna take care of it if we can't get to it? That would be my, I guess my biggest problem. I just, if we have money, I, I don't think we're spending it well. Uh, there was a uh, impact statement uh, done by Save the Sound. They do Long Island Sound, and they did 51 sightings in Long Island Sound uh, as far as bacteria was concerned. The dirtiest place out of the 51 was in Mount Vernon on the Hutchison River. And so it's coming down into the Bronx, so we're going to do this whatever. Uh, the thing that I'm working on now is really to try to get a watershed meeting with the Hutch and the Mimaronic River, that's our combined watershed, to get all the communities from the Bronx and, and from the Hutch in Westchester to come together, e either in the listing of the places that are there on the Hutch coming down from Scarsdale to the Bronx, they either are totally contaminated or have never been tested. And so that is what I am working on now. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Rob Buchanan. Thanks very much for the opportunity to testify and thank you for sitting in this cold room so long. Um, it's been a long day. Uh, I'm with a group called New York City Water Trail Association. We are uh, an umbrella group of harbor boaters, and so we spend a lot of time in the water that we've been talking about today. Um, about five years ago, we started a testing program because we felt the information from the city wasn't adequate to make good decisions about when the water was clean and when it wasn't, and so we have accumulated a lot of data. I think we run one of the, or coordinate one of the biggest citizen science projects, at least water related, that there is in the city right now. Um, I just, uh, I'm not going to take three minutes, I just want to say um, four things that I think that the city council could do. And the first is that uh, we have two more of these long-term control plans coming. The, the last of them is something called East River and Open Waters that covers the whole city. It's really a huge amount of water and I think that the city council could pressure the DEC to in turn pressure the DEP to break that down into smaller compartments so that uh, community groups and, and locals who really know their waters can have some role in deciding what happens. Otherwise, everything is lumped together in one big bucket. The average picture is good and the small things don't get taken care of. The second thing is that the DEP could be pressured to test uh, in different places than they do right now. This is just a graph that shows our results versus theirs. When you test near the shore, the numbers are higher, they could test in more near shore locations than they do and they would get a better picture of what's really going on out there. The third thing is notification and monitoring is really out of date. We've talked about text alerts today. Those are virtually worthless. They're, they're the same thing as getting a text to say, hey, it rained yesterday. It could be much, much better. They know it, we know it, but there just hasn't been much progress on that. So that'd be an easy thing. Um, to, to push for and uh, I don't think really would cost too much in the scheme of things. And the last thing is, is more of a visionary thing, but, but I think what would help really push this forward and make people think about the harbor in a different way is to create a, a bathing beach inside the upper harbor. According to uh, everybody's data, our data, their data, this should be possible uh, with, with really good um, and regular testing, we ought to be able to predict where it's uh, okay to swim and when it's okay to swim and we ought to, we ought to 
put our money where our mouth is and, and make a beach or beaches, and there are a lot of great places to do that. So I hope that's something the council can work towards. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'm Andrea Parker. I'm the executive director of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. Um, we are a community-based environmental steward for the Gowanus watershed. Um, we're dedicated to facilitating the development of a resilient, vibrant open space network centered on the Gowanus Canal through activating and empowering community stewardship of the watershed. Um, we do want to commend the work that the DEP has done on achieving better water quality in the canal. Um, we are lucky that they've fixed the flushing tunnel, um, fixed the pumping station, and are constructing a high-level sewer system, but there's still a lot more that could be done. Um, I think the, what Rob just mentioned about the water quality testing is really true on the Gowanus. They sample at the center of the canal, um, so their DEP's water quality tests show a very different picture than citizen water quality tests. Um, DEP says the canal is swimmable. It is certainly not swimmable. Um, the long-term control plan for Gowanus, um, which is based on this faulty data, doesn't do anything to improve water quality because we are also a federal Superfund site. Um, instead of saying the Superfund's doing the work, we should get additional infrastructure to address the 100 million gallons of untreated sewage that will still overflow even after the Superfund is done. Um, as several people have mentioned, the, our long-term control plan does not take into account the rezoning process that's currently underway in Gowanus. Um, this will add significant load to the sewage system. As the mayor and the city aim to add more residential units and toilets to the watershed, we need to see a comprehensive plan to mitigate all additional wa wastewater this will add to the system. And this should include both requirements for new development and residential conversions, as well as more capital money for um, gray and green infrastructure in the watershed. Um, green infrastructure is, you know, I, we've been very happy by how much green infrastructure we have already gotten. There could still be a lot more, but it needs to be done in a way that um, really leverages the support of the community. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now in Gowanus is that the green infrastructure that has been installed is not being maintained properly. Um, and that's really eroding the goodwill of the watershed community. Um, we understand that the contractor guarantee period is an impediment to this maintenance, but we think the DEP needs to start weekly maintenance visits as soon as right-of-way installations are in the ground and to engage neighbors as adopters or stewards to extend the efficacy of these assets. Um, as has been mentioned, the private property um, green infrastructure program needs massive improvement. There's so much potential in our watershed to build green infrastructure on private property and it's not being leveraged. Um, and then DEP really needs to embrace innovative design and interagency collaboration. Um, in Gowanus, we have a Second Street Sponge Park, which is a street end green infrastructure installation. It's a great example of maximizing um, stormwater management with innovative design. The park is currently managing a fifth of design capacity because the interagency team did not resolve how to get water across street intersections. This is you know, really low hanging fruit. It's just an engineering problem to get the water across the street. Um, we, you know, want city council to really push the city agencies to work together to figure this out. Um, I also want to talk about equity in sewage infrastructure siting. I know I just ran out of time and Michael Higgins from Fury is going to be testifying soon. So I agree with everything he's going to say about it. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to your constituents. Um, I'm Carmen Melian. I'm part of the Empire Dragon Boat um, team. We're New York's first uh, all-cancer uh, uh, dragon boat team. We paddle in Flushing Bay together with uh, many other hundreds of human-powered uh, boats. We compete up and down the uh, eastern seaboard, representing the New York spirit. and. Um, well, next year we will be going to Italy, hopefully, for the internationals, the breast cancer internationals. Um, in addition to our missions of healthy uh, living and exercise for cancer survivors, Empire has been dedicated to the stewardship of the waters of New York City. We have been sponsoring a cleanup of Flushing Bay shoreline for the past eight years. If anybody wants to join us in May, please do. We have the Boy Scouts and um, all sorts of uh, people. Um, we also have participated in oyster gardening with the Billion Oyster Project. 
Just so you know, every oyster um, will filter 50 gallons of water a day. And we also work with the water quality testing with the Waterkeeper, uh, Waterkeepers Alliance and with Queens College. Um, we do this, do I keep it on, my finger on? I don't know. Anyway, we do this because the water quality situation in Flushing Bay in New York Harbor is alarming and distressing. Flushing Bay receives over two billion gallons of combined sewer overflow every year. Our sewage system becomes overwhelmed at even the lightest rainfall, and with climate change, we know we can expect more storms that are increasingly intense. We ask that the City Council pay serious attention to this alarming situation. Our infrastructure is old and deteriorating, and we need increased investment in capturing sewage overflows and industrial run uh, runoff. Uh, after the rains, and it doesn't take much, let me tell you, um, we paddle amongst drowned sewer rats, condoms, plastic, all sorts of really lovely stuff. We gag as we pass uh, one of the three CS largest CSOs in uh, New York, and uh, we keep going, and we rinse off the, immediately when we get off. And we, uh, we all wear glasses to make sure we don't get eye infections because some of our teams have gotten them. Um, this all sounds really gross, but we also paddle. We have a practice on Wednesday evenings, and we'd love to take you out if you'd like to come with us. And as the sun, you know, sort of goes down, you have this wonderful peace, and you, you have a glimpse of what this place could be. Nobody, there's no access to um, uh, Flushing Bay Marina, which was part of the World's Fair, and um, it could really be something fantastic. Um, we are especially distressed by the DEP um, uh, wanting to chlorinate. If you have had cancer, you know that being around um, toxic chemicals is not good. We don't want it for ourselves. We don't want it for you. You don't want it for your children. Um, this last-minute chlorination has not been tested. It's going to kill the oysters and all the small um, you know, baby shrimp, all of that. And there's no reason for it. And as you're, um, you know, as the committee found out, you know, uh, uh, Councilman Torres, they have made up their mind and they're not going to listen to us. They haven't listened to us. And that isn't right. As it says on the ceiling, a government of the people, for the people, by the people, for the people. And you, you know, you guys have to help us. You know, they're not listening. They're well-intentioned, but they're just trying to save a buck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. That's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Okay. This is the last man. Yes, it is. <clears throat> last but not least, Jose Sigard, Tracy Brown, Michael Higgins Jr. Mr. Jose Segard, would you would you say your last name so I can say it properly? <laughs> Sogard. Oh, Sogard. Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you please raise your right hand? <clears throat> best. Uh, best for last. <clears throat> can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I yeah. do. Good afternoon. Um, I am Jose Sogard, Director of Policy for Waterfront Alliance, a nonprofit civic organization working to revitalize New York Harbor and waterways. I will read a brief summary of our written statement, as many of the points um, that we make in our testimony have already been made today. Um, clean water is a critical concern for millions of people across our island metropolis. Thanks to progress spurred by the Clean Water Act, there are more people boating, fishing, swimming, and more fish, shellfish, and birds populating the waters. 
While toxins have been reduced considerably, significant problems persist. We still have a long way to go, as we've heard all day, in order to meet the standards of fishable and swimmable waters. And I want to make a point that it's important to frame this challenge as not only improving our waterways, but improving our quality of life. I'd like to respectfully rebut uh, a point that was made earlier this morning uh, by the Deputy Commissioner um, that the investment in clean water is part of a zero-sum game. Um, in fact, I believe many of the folks in this room would argue that is it a positive-sum game, um, as economists would say, um, and that environmental benefits produce economic benefits. Healthy habitats foster social well-being that improves the regional economy. Um, you've heard uh, from other advocates and experts, as well as uh, those wonderful students, about CSOs and green infrastructure and the impact to uh, local water bodies of, of uh, combined sewer outfall. And unfortunately, we are codifying underinvestment um, in clean water infrastructure. We echo uh, the several calls that have already been made for greater review and financing for CSO remediation plans that meet higher targets for sewage capture uh, prevent, uh, to prevent uh, harmful pollution. Um, uh, there are several other points in our written statement. I'd like to just make w uh, one additional point and piggyback off of um, points that several of the uh, most the previous panelists made about um, how the city conducts uh, tests uh, of water quality. Uh, you heard from uh, Rob Buchanan of the New York City Water Trail Association, which runs the city uh, uh, citizens' water quality uh, testing program. Uh, earlier this year, we identified uh, disparities between um, official water testing samples uh, conducted by the city, uh, which are taken in mid-channel locations, and those, as Rob said, uh, collected by citizen science uh, which are taken at near shore areas where people are actually using the water for recreation and education. Citizen science samples failed uh, federally accepted bacteria standards for safe swimming in roughly 33 percent of tests while the city samples failed approximately 20 percent of samples. Um, what's the reason for the discrepancy? Uh, there are several concerns about the methods of quality control uh, for these tests. Um, but we encourage, we strongly encourage the city to take heed of the citizen science results in order to better inform its own program so that data reflect actual risks to actual users. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present our testimony, um, and I look forward to your questions. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tracy Brown. I'm director of Save the Sound. Save the Sound's mission is to restore and protect Long Island Sound and its environments, and Long Island Sound extends into the Upper East River um, to Randall, <coughs> Randall's Island um, and this part of New York City. <clears throat> Today, my testimony on wastewater is on a slightly different pollutant that you've that we hasn't come up yet today, which is nitrogen um, pollution from wastewater. And I have written testimony. I'll just offer a brief summary. Um, for decades, excess nitrogen entering coastal waters have devastated the health of Long Island Sound and the Upper East River. The impacts are clear. Low oxygen waters, fish die-offs, harmful algal blooms, and disappearing coastal marshes. We've made progress reducing human-generated nitrogen pollution over the last 20 years, but we must make further reductions if we truly want to achieve a healthy sound that's safe for people and wildlife. New York City recently met an important goal established in 2001 to reduce nitrogen pollution entering Long Island Sound from East River wastewater treatment plants by 58.5 percent based on 1990 levels. This investment in the health of the Sound and the East River will pay dividends in cleaner water and healthier ecosystem. Thanks to this investment and similar ones made in other Sound coastal communities, the low oxygen dead zones in Western Long Island Sound are now smaller. However, they are still there, stretching from the East River past the coast of Westchester and Nassau County in hot summer months wrecking havoc on marine life and critical ecosystems. There's a map that shows the, the area of hypoxia um, in my written testimony, um, and the red areas mark where it is you know, critically frequent 
um, where there's not enough oxygen to sustain marine life. <clears throat> New York City's six East River wastewater treatment plants discharge about 25 tons of nitrogen every day into the East River. These six plants account for 97% of the total nitrogen coming into the sound from the East River and, and the city. In response to the ongoing harm caused by excess nitrogen entering our waterways from treated wastewater and untreated combined sewer overflows, Save the Sound offers three recommendations. One, at this time, New York City is trading nitrogen credits with Westchester County, which has yet to meet its own nitrogen reduction commitment. This demonstrates the city's ability to exceed the 58.5% nitrogen removal target that they are already committed to. Based on this fact and the need to continue to ratchet down on nitrogen for the health and future of Long Island Sound, the East River, and our communities, Save the Sound calls on New York City to increase its nitrogen treatment at the four upgraded treatment plants to achieve a 70% nitrogen reduction in 2018 and beyond. Number two, I just have two, two remaining points. Um, if additional nitrogen reductions are needed, upgrading the Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant to include nitrogen re removal should be evaluated. This plant is one of two that remain on the East River that did not get this nitrogen treatment upgrade, and it is, uh, accounts for 30% of the remaining nitrogen load that's entering the East River today. Finally, number three, Save the Sound calls on New York City to clean the bays and harbors of the East River and Long Island Sound by revisiting and improving the combined sewer overflow long-term control plans for those communities. These waterways are home to Orchard Beach and many other neighborhood swimming clubs where the public most often comes into direct contact with city waters. They're stressed from nitrogen pollution and fecal bacteria pollution. Strategies designed to meet safe fecal bacteria standards should not come at the expense of other environmental goals and responsibilities, such as protecting our living shorelines, coastal habitats, and the wildlife they rely on. Save the Sound calls on New York City to reject chlorination of CSOs in Alley Creek, Flushing Creek, and Hutchinson River, and to focus instead on CSO flow reduction. Thank you for your time today and for listening to our testimony. Uh, good afternoon, committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify, and I'll try to be brief because I'm cold, and I know I'm the last person, and I'm gonna allow people to get out of here. Uh, my name is Michael Higgins, Jr. I'm a, a community organizer for a group called FURY, Families United for Racial and Economic Equality. Uh, FURY is part of a collaborative call, Turning the Tide, uh, also known as T3, which is a community-based uh, collaboration uh, led by the Fifth Avenue Committee in partnership with uh, Red Hook Initiative, uh, Southwest Brooklyn Industrial uh, Development Corporation, and uh, other uh, community-based uh, organizations, uh, one of which is Guanas Canal Conservancy, which uh, testified previously. So uh, to be brief, um, my testimony is about three main issues that affect us down Gowanus. Um, as uh, Andrea mentioned, uh, we are the site of a super fund, and so we are uh, experiencing hundreds of millions of dollars in development, not only in the remediation of the canal, but also in real estate. And so as we go forward, um, we are scheduled to uh, have two new uh, retention tanks to be installed, one eight million uh, gallons, one four million gallons. Um, but uh, there is still a, uh, a dearth in really uh, infrastructure and a, I think what can be probably the densest CSO area in the city. Uh, so. Part of my testimony is about the uh, conditions that unfortunately residents around the canal have to live in, uh, most notably people in NYCHA. Uh, the, uh, the Gowanus Canal is uh, around three small developments, uh, Gowanus Houses, Warren Street Houses, and uh, Rykoff Gardens. And for some of the residents, especially residents who live on the first floor of their buildings, um, in situations where there is a uh, CSO uh, problem, that means that that CSO is, is backing into their, their bathrooms, backing into their tubs, backing into their, their kitchens. And so it's a very serious issue, and I think that um, there has been a back and forth between NYCHA and DEP about whose role is it to create infrastructure to stop that from happening, and I hope you all can um, lead that discussion. Um, second, uh, we have this issue of um, increasing development 
and uh, the Gwanis Canal is the end of a of the Gwanis watershed. So that's uh, Carroll Gardens to the west, Park Slope to the east, and downtown Brooklyn to the north. So all three areas ra rapidly growing. And so what was uh, mentioned before, this issue of um, diversion or the displacement of flow, we would like to have that addressed just because um, the people down near the canal are facing a huge brunt of that burden, and that's not fair. Uh, last but not least, uh, because the area is rapidly uh, growing and seeing rapid development, especially in the uh, uh, midst of a planned rezoning, uh, we would like there to be uh, some level of questions about any building that's built in addition should have um, some sort of uh, remediation of their, them doing their own job to deal with the waste that they're going to be producing for the canal. And uh, thank you for just thank you for allowing me to testify. that want to uh, have something to say? Be there are none, then I think we're finished <laughs> for, the, for now. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.